Hello. If we could, let's call this meeting to order. Everybody sit if you're going to sit. This morning we have with us Ron Guzman, who is the minister at West Angelo Church of Christ. If you would please come forward and lead us in prayer. Great. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings that you give to our land, our city, our people. Help us, Father, to use those blessings in ways that will honor you. Help us to use the wisdom that you have given to us. Help us to use the wisdom of our forefathers and those, those before us. Help us to be sensitive with the decisions that we make. Help those who tackle those, this agenda this morning and today that they may do so in ways that are wise for all concerned. We ask for your blessings now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I could have Tristan and Barrett please come forward. Are you guys ready to lead us in our pledge today? Okay. Tristan Bue, is that how I pronounce it? Kind of. <laughs> Cub Scout. And Barrett Bradbury also is a Cub Scout. So we thank you for leading us in our pledge today. We'll now go into the proclamation and recognition. Um, recognition of the City of San Angel Budget Division. Megan, would you and your group please come forward? In short form, what we are doing today is recognizing the City of San Angel Budget Division for receiving the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Thank you. For all of you, and that is um, Megan, it is Walt, and it is Kimberly. Thank you. have a proclamation. Um, please join us as we join the City of Orlando and Orange County in conjunction with Pulse in recognizing June 12, 2017 as Orlando United Day, a day of love and kindness. This announcement formally dedicates June 12 to the memory and honor of the 49 innocent lives taken at Pulse reaffirms the community's commitment to survivors and loved ones, as well as recognizes the global compassion and love displayed in the wake of the tragedy. Our community will never forget the tragedy of Pulse or the grief of those who lost loved ones, from heartbroken family and friends to survivors, putting shattered lives back together, our entire community stands with you. As we prepare for the one year mark of the Pulse tragedy, the world is working to honor and remember the lives we lost. 
through a day of love and kindness dedicated to the legacy of those who perished, we will continue to cherish their memories. Now, therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the June 12, 2017 as Orlando United Day, a day of love and kindness. May I please have Amanda come forward and accept this proclamation? Congratulations. We are actually doing a, um, we're doing a memorial service on the 12th out at the Lone, uh, Lone Wolf Bridge. And they're going to actually light up the, light up the bridge in rainbow colors. Uh, we would love for you guys to join us. Now is our time to um, take public comment. Uh, issues or items that are not on the agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, begin by stating their name, and limit remarks to less than three minutes. Council members may request that a discussed item be placed on a future agenda. The council takes public comment on all regular agenda items during this discussion. Are there any? Is there anyone who would like to come forward and speak to the council? Please state um, your name. Uh, Jamie Lee Tabor. Um, I know y'all have budgets and all that stuff, and you may not can't even you know bring it up to the forefront. But along where Pecos and I believe it's Howard, I looked it up last night. That intersection, you know where it's a medical arts pharmacy in that area, and then, you know, what used to be Shakey's is a little bit of other businesses. It is very difficult for a pedestrian, uh, you know, to cross the street, coming and going. I went to my pharmacy, I had my cart with me yesterday. So it's extremely difficult to, with the traffic, because you have, you know, when you're coming out of medical arts, you have uh, a left-hand turn lane, and people going this way and coming that way. So just consider, if y'all can, it's, uh, that's just one of the most difficult intersections when it's uh, traffic busy uh, for a pedestrian and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to come forward? Morning. My name is David Wood. I'm president of the Railway Museum of San Angelo, and uh, <coughs> <coughs> I'm not supposed to speak. You need some water. <coughs> <So we'll coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, um, we had a meeting with city staff. Uh, Ms. Gunner and um, Tommy Hebert yesterday at City Hall to discuss the lease that is coming up for renewal for the historic Orient Santa Fe Depot Incorporated, which has the Railway Museum of San Angelo. And for six months, we have tried to work with the city, um, given counter proposals back. The city has been good in being a partner with us and helping us out with some of the funding of uh, the maintenance of the building on the outside and elevator and the air conditioning system. Um, however, as you stated, Ms. Gunner, that they really don't want to do that anymore. 
Uh, they don't want to partner and be partner and fund those things that have been funded in the past. And I believe there is an executive session coming up after this, which is, of course, secret, and you can talk about all sorts of things, and nobody ever knows what's going on. But uh, I'd like to ask for the support of the council in maintaining some of the expenses. And we have laid out what we would like to do. Uh, we agreed yesterday, since it was going nowhere, that the city staff would not give us any feedback as to what they wanted to do, except for not pay anything. Uh, we agreed if that's the way it's got to be, we will try to do that. And it's going to be a hardship, but I think we can. It will curtail a whole lot of uh, plans that we have for the future of expanding the museum. Uh, but we would really like to keep in partnership with the city under the lease that they originally drew up 20 years ago. Thank you. Is this on executive session? We have a discussion for <clears throat> we have a discussion for property for uh, it's a contract discussion. So yes. Would anybody else like to come forward and make any public comment? Good morning. Hi, Good morning. my name is Barbara Rice, and my concern is an ordinance that was passed a couple of years ago concerning dogs and stuff. I can only tell you what happened to me, and I talked with Ms. Gonzalez, so she kind of familiar with what was going on. My concern is that my dogs was picked up, family dogs was picked up, um, taken to the pound by the police department, not by the dog pound, but by the police department. And when we finally found out where the dogs was, they had already been uh, uh, what they call spaded. They had already been chipped. Uh, they had already been given shots. And uh, my family was the one that had to pay for everything. And it was like f almost $500 for all of that for us to get the dogs. So we gathered up the money, we got the dogs, how about two days later, the dogs was out again. Well, my, my feeling is, and like I told Ms. Gonzalez, the dogs never got out. The dogs was let out. That's, that's what we believe. The second time, the dogs was let out too. So when they got them the second time, it was a fine of like $300. So we decided, oh, well, that's seven $1,000 almost in a month to get dogs. So we decided just to give up on the dogs, no more dogs. But my concern is, I think, I believe that when the dog pound, police department, whoever take the dogs, I think we should be given a chance before we go through all the process. The ordinance was passed a couple of years ago, but I think it need to be re-looked at because it doesn't give the dogs a chance. And if you're gonna adopt the dogs out, you know, that's something the owner, that's when they no normally neuter and spade the dogs. but right when they get the dogs, they do all of this stuff to the dogs, and if the, um, if the owner want them back, they have to pay for that. If the owner don't want them back, then what, I feel like the city is just wasting money spading dogs, but even if the dogs don't get adopted out, they already spend money spading them, neutering them, chipping them, and doing all of this. So I feel like it's a waste, you know. Before the fact, I think dogs should be neutered and spaded when someone wants to adopt them because they're already locked up, they're already in the pound, how are they gonna get out and, you know what I mean? So I just feel like it's just the community need to know that the first time your dogs get out, that's what will happen to them. They will be spaded, neutered, chipped at your expense and if you don't want them, I think it's the expense of the city because sooner or later they will be put to sleep if don't nobody adopt them. So I feel like all that work and then you're still gonna put the dogs to sleep. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Good morning. My name is Brandi Petty, and I'm actually here in support of the railroad as well. And I'm a new face for a lot of you who've actually been working with David on the railroad situation, the Railway Museum. I come here to urge you to remember 
for every conversation in the future about the Railway Museum. I want you to remember our kids. I know I think about my kids. I think of my friends' kids because they're all my age. And we're all becoming the age where we're becoming the leadership of San Angelo. And one day, those children and their children, your grandchildren's, um, will also be fulfilling that role. And when they do that, I want them to be people, and I think you can all agree with me, who know our cultural history, who are endowed with the history of San Angelo, the history of business, not just in San Angelo, but in the United States. I want them to be endowed with every resource we already have in San Angelo that's unique and not something that you just find in every town you go to, something that helps make San Angelo a draw to prospective tourists and businesses. And rather than lose that resource, I want you to remember what it's gonna be like one day, and I hope I get a grandbaby one day, to walk hand in hand into that building that is a piece of artwork and to be able to teach them because that resource is still there and available about who we are and why we are to help endow them with the ability to fulfill these roles of leadership as we really, truly dream for them to be able to do. I want San Angelo to grow and to improve. And I think that one of the things to make that necessary is to fulfill our artistic, our historical, and our cultural resources and endow them with better facilities better capabilities to give that to our kids and our future in San Angelo. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Morning Council, Ryan Kramer, Superintendent of Fleet Services. Just wanted to make our citizens aware that we will be having a surplus auction, uh, mostly vehicles and equipment. Um, it will be starting probably any day this week. It is an online auction, so uh, any interested bidder needs to uh, visit ReneeBates.com. That's R-E-N-E-B-A-T-E-S.com. And there they can find our auction right now. It's only viewable. You can see what's going to be in the auction. But any day now, uh, probably today or tomorrow, um, it will be open for bid. And, and it, I believe it closes June 27th. Why don't you come on up to the front row so you'll be ready to speak, okay? <laughs> we want to hear from you, too. Um, my name is Sylvia Martinez, and I came down uh, to talk about the city uh, part uh, right away. Um, the right away, uh, when they built those buildings on South Oaks and Chadburn, they did not, back then, uh, you know, did enough parking. All we have is the right of way. If you do not let us open our business, we pay taxes, we pay stormwater, we pay light, we pay water, then y'all have to find a solution so we can, y'all buy it from us because y'all not letting us get do nothing. Right now, I even let the Church of Freedom Fellowship try to open a pantry. It just been uh, around around ma'am I'm trying to help the city uh, for the homeless you know help them feed the people here and I would appreciate that you all give me the right of way for it's just the in and out thing we have parking all across you know like tent that is you know city right away and y'all have to sit down and think of these old buildings that were established long time ago that don't have, uh, you know, parking. A lot of them exist. A lot of them have not been going through what I've gone through. I've been un under a lot of stress because I have to pay those bills. I have to pay, like I said, I have to uh, pay my taxes, storm water, water, and light, either if it's close or not. And I would appreciate that y'all think of something or try to help us now that I'm trying to help the Freedom Fellowship get the pantry going because it's not when it's not this it's that well it's for it's for the church I could understand when 
they didn't let me do nothing, but get real. This is for the church. I'm trying to help the poor here. And everybody is, maybe not none of us in here needs the food, but maybe one of day your children, hopefully not, will need that food that these people are trying to give the people. If the, if the town can't give it, the city can't give it, let the church give it. Give us the okay for the parking. That's all I ask for the city right away. That's all I'm asking, which is not. And then, you know, they, they keep giving us the run around about, you know, and I understand we have to go through all the red tapes and everything, but get real. This is for the church, Thank you know, you. and I don't want no break. I just want you all to make a solution for us to have the city right away. And maybe y'all need to study on, on Oak Street because we have Fort Contra down there and we've been forgotten. If that is the place that we're supposed to have it, I'm, I'm leaving, because a lot of people go to Fort Concho. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yes. We do have an item, uh, item 6C, that'll address alternate parking uh, plan, basically, so that item will be coming up as well. So thank you for those comments, appreciate it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Good morning and hello. My name is Lane Horwood. I'm also here with the support of the San Angelo Railroad and Heritage Museum. As the San Angelo Railroad and Heritage Museum has always been a special place to me. As a child, my grandparents took me every Christmas to see and play with the trains. As the years went on, I would miss from time to time the annual Christmas party at the museum, but my interest for railroads never ceased. Now that I have gotten older, I am realizing that I learned much more than just playing with the trains or learning about the history of our railroads in San Angelo. I learned that I have a deep interest for history as well as protecting it, specifically our rich West Texas history that my grandmother instilled in me. Once I came to bear with this, I pursued a degree at Texas Tech in history and received that degree this past December. Now that I'm out and had the opportunity to be a part of this board with this museum I grew up going to, I hope now even more that I can be a part of the future for this museum. After all, one could say this museum promoted my passion to receive the degree that I so pursued. And I believe it could push other people as well to pursue the same degree and career that I hope to pursue. Texas is currently ranked 43rd in education of our great United States. And here we stand in the larger cities of rural West Texas, wanting to shut down a museum that promotes the growth of education as well as preserving our rich culture. It is a crying shame that the city wants to remove a museum of this caliber from this region. This museum hosts several events, as well as school children to get out of the classroom and have the opportunity to receive hands-on learning about railroading history pertaining to this area. I hope that you can find it in yourselves to protect this museum and its capacity to teach future students of our West Texas history like my grandmother always did for me. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, sir, come on up. My name is Floyd Satan. I worked 40 years for this railroad. I came here as a young man, 19 years old, to work down here. I've worked all over the railroad. It's been 61 years since I came here. And we have worked on that since uh, they sold the railroad. We have worked continuously trying to build that into a museum. How many of you have been to the museum? How many? I'm sorry, I didn't see all. If you haven't been to the museum, you need to go. I was a telegraph operator for 20 years. I put on a, a demonstration every Saturday for the kids and everybody that wants to hear the old telegraph. 
I still remember it. We used to telegraph until 1984. So please don't take our museum away. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment? Say my name every time. Please do. Okay. Jamie Lee Tabor. Uh, I just want to know how much does it cost to upkeep that depot? And I've known David, uh, David Wood and his wife for years and stuff. I've never been myself, but uh, my question was just how much is the upkeep and that is that why you won't re renew the lease possibly, you know? Mayor, this is only for public comment at this point, so uh, we don't have a responsible impact on the future. If this is an item that comes back, we can address it out in the open, though, so, yeah. All right, thank you. Any other further comment? Good morning. My name's Bliss Bignall. I'm also here to speak for the Railroad Depot. I don't know if the council is aware of the bus loads of school children every year that come to the depot uh, and learn about the history of this area. I don't know if the council is aware of the people not only from Texas but around the country and even around the world that come here specifically to see the depot. They aren't coming to see Fort Concho. They're coming to see the Railroad Depot. There's a whole group of people that do that. And I don't know if you're aware of that. We have thousands of visitors a year. The, the museum in the depot is a tourist draw for this town. It is an asset to this community. And for the city to refuse to support it and to refuse to keep the lease going is criminal in my mind. I'm, I'm ashamed to be a member of this town. Thank you. Any further comment? All right, we will close the public comment and go on to the consent agenda. Is there, um, at this point, we are asking to pull 5E from the consent agenda for a later date. Is there um, any other items that council would like to pull uh, from the consent agenda? Charlotte, I'd sorry. I'd like to pull item B, and I wanted to pull E also, but um, item B. Okay. Any other items? Pull item F. Does anybody else have an item they want to pull? All right. I would like to make a public comment, if I may. Yes, you may. Uh, with reference to the historic uh, railroad museum, I was not aware that the city was refusing to renew the contract, or the city was insistent upon closing that. That's not my feeling or my intention, and I was no. not aware of that. So, Charlotte, that's not the case. But anyway, with this, this is really an item that we can't discuss at this point. But that's not the work. case. That'll no. okay. work. That's my only comment. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, let's. Um, Charlotte, you wanted to pull item B. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Well, need to uh, move for the oh, approval of the. All right, Side so we will pull item B, and we will pull item F, F mm -hmm. and um, may I have a motion to approve the rest of the items on the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item B and item F. Second. Just one second, Brian. Need one change to that motion, including the postponement of item E. Including the postponement of item E. Okay. A second from Harry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right, so um, let's then discuss um, item B. Uh, 
Uh, a, <coughs> move to approve the minutes. Is Item A. Me? What about it? Well, I think we just approved all of the consent agenda, didn't With the we? exception of, okay. okay. Item B. Okay. I'm lost. Sorry. I'm probably lost, but so excuse me for being my first meeting. So Could we will get this worked out. Explain mm -hmm. this to me because I didn't quite understand what you're asking for. Right. So basically what we're asking for with this item is to put it, this out for bid under the com sealed competitive. Or wait, let me make sure I'm saying that correctly. The competitive sealed proposal system. Um, I believe some more of these questions will be answered in item 6H as far as under the regular agenda, but it has to do with state law that and how we approve the, the use of, I mean, maybe Teresa can help me with this a little bit, but um, it was basically how we, you know, council asked us to put all of our bids out under the competitive sealed proposal system, and we didn't adopt there's a provision in state law that requires before we use an alternative method of bidding, such as the competitive sealed proposals, the council has to make a determination that using that method is the best value for the city. Now in this case, it's something we're evaluating going forward on whether or not the policy directive that was handed down from council a few years ago really isn't the best value for getting any benefit from that now. But for this particular item, um, this is the only method by which we will be able to efficiently process this bid and be able to do the seal coating program this year. So even though the value may not be monetary in this case, the value is efficiency in this case. And so we would ask that you approve. Move to approve as presented. Second. Any comment? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Six zero. Seven zero, seven. actually. I'm still down here, Brenda. <laughs> zero, I'm counting you in. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> right. Um, item F. Harry, you wanted item F pulled? Good morning. Right. Uh, I think my question here is, is we've got a proposed new tenant they want to renegotiate the lease for this particular new tenant. Uh, I'd like to see whether there's any additional rev revenue available to the city when we do that. There, there is no renegotiation. They're assuming the lease. Okay. It's a consent to assignment of the current lease. So the, the 63 plus cents a month that the lease that we're presently doing that we're transferring to the new tenant is, is the best that the city is going to be able to do. Yes, that's in our rates, uh, approved rates and charges. Or conditions. What is sure. the length of time left on that lease? I believe it's, uh, I don't remember the month, it's, it's two years it's two left. Years. And what was the full term of the lease? Five years. Okay. And we have the new owners here present if you have any questions about them. I actually met them this morning. I worked with their grandfather at Goodyear, so. Any other comment? Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. That's second. presented. All in, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 7-0. Thank you. <clears throat> now we will move to the regular agenda. Six A. Consider the first public hearing of an amendment to an ordinance of the City of San Angelo amending Chapter Three Animal Control <coughs> Sections Three Point Oh One Point Oh Oh Three, appearance in court required of the Code of Ordinances to outline and clarify authorization to issue citations for violation of animal control ordinances. Robert. You ready to present? Well, good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, this is a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we want to clean up the language uh, identifying who could issue citations under the Animal Control Ordinance. Uh, currently, the language cites certain positions such as the Animal Services Director, Animal Services Officer, and Technician, uh, those who are authorized to issue those citations. Uh, however, as you know, positions change, names change. Uh, unfortunately, that causes problems during the... Um, 
court proceedings. So uh, we'd like to simplify the language to something that says duly authorized agents of the city who meet all state requirements imposed by the state law. And we're asking council to approve. Move to approve as presented. Second. I'll second. Any further comment? I have a question, Mayor. Bob, you know, sometimes we do some things that, that create unintended consequences and sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. I'm assuming you tried to think through those things because if, if we've got, if, if it's problematic now, does the vagueness of saying, you know, certified through you know, peace officers with all the proper certifications and so forth, does that create unintended consequences that we may have to deal with later? I don't expect so. Uh, I believe it be actually is going to help it. Uh, it's going to be simplify it. It will make it easier for us uh, to identify those folks who are certified. They have to go through a state certification, and once they get their animal control officer certification, uh, they can take action. Or those folks who we deem necessary uh, to issue those citations. So, so I think it's going to simplify it. So it's everyone is going to have to go through the training. Yes, there will be. Ha have the training. They'll have to be certified by the, by the state law, but whatever, whatever that, and if that changes, we change with it. So, uh, and so the, the, the face can change and as yes. long, okay. All exactly. Right. All right, good, thanks. Yes, Lucy. Uh, Bob, how many people do you have right now that are certified that will be able to write out the citations? Uh, let me defer that to James. I think he's back here. James, you want to handle this question, please? Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, there's five. Uh, I'm the sixth one that's certified. Um, and the certification process or the ordinance allows, the state law allows for anybody to get into an animal control position and have up to a year to become certified. So of those six, uh, we got three that are uh, going through that year process to get certified. But today, um, once this is approved, there would be six uh, people available to write citations under the current ordinance. And that have been certified? Uh, three of us have. The other three are in that annual training. It's kind of like code enforcement. You work under someone else's off uh, license for the first year of your, uh, up to a year. The state gives you up to a year to get certified. And if they didn't do it within that year, then they would obviously not be certified and thus not approved to write citations. Absolutely, yes, until they get certified. Your department tracks all of that so we know the Department of State Health Services okay. does it's a right. it's a bona fide state license but yes we do as well we keep it in their personnel file is this important to do because we have such an issue that you need more people feet on the ground <laughs> yes ma'am unfortunately we do have an issue uh, a big issue and uh, even at six we're, we're still way behind but we're a lot better off than where we were at um, it's every day. It, it just doesn't stop with our problem with, uh, you know, irresponsible ownership. And we, this is going to help solve that problem or, or at least get us a better, uh, another tool in our shed to use uh, to educate and, and promote, you know, responsible ownership. That's all we're asking for. Okay. Thank you. Maybe, maybe the better yes. question, James, is how many people do you need to do the job? <laughs> for a problem this size? Well, you know, we do per capita, just like everybody else, I guess. And, and uh, typically speaking, uh, per capita population of ours is about 9.5 officers, uh, two supervisors involved. So you get into 11 and 12. Um, it's a big problem. I mean, it's, it's uh, it, it, but, you know, that's, we understand the economic situations we're in and <laughs> we do what we can with what we got. So uh, this is just to, to help us better our, our, our tool capacity in our shed. Thank you for asking, though. <laughs> Anything else? Out of curiosity, can yes, a police officer write out a citation? Absolutely. They can write the same citations we can. <clears throat> Any other questions? All in favor of, a, oh, oh, sorry, public comment? Hello, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Rosh the Khan and I just needed a bit of clarification. So there, he mentioned six, but only three are certified. 
So does that mean there's three animal control officers active at this point writing citations, or is it six? And um, how much will this cost eventually? Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, for clarification, if I hire anybody in here today as an animal control officer, they are authorized to write citations. They have for up to a year to get certified. Uh, so right now, we have one guy uh, who surpassed his year uh, because of changes that we've done at the shelter. Uh, animal control was something that we focused on just till recently. Uh, we, I took over in March of 15. We decided to change the kill rate, change some disinfecting processes, some feeding processes, look at the budget. Animal control was not an issue at that time just, just because of the changes that we felt the community was asking us to do. Uh, so Floyd, who is an animal control officer that's been doing it for over a year, cannot write citations today. Um, he can, though, however, file through, through the municipal court system, which is another avenue. The problem with that is it's very tedious. It's a lot of paperwork, but any citizen could file uh, for that matter. So Floyd, so there's five that can write citations. Uh, two uh, are un, in that year span, and uh, in October, we've convinced the uh, state, the, the head of the DH, DSHS to come down to San Angelo and offer the training uh, so that we don't expend any money certifying anybody. Um, so to answer her question in that regard, it's going to cost the city nothing. Uh, we, we do this in code enforcement about four years ago. Uh, we decided to write our own curriculum for code enforcement registration and open it up to the, to the surrounding cities. I barbecue for them and we put on a class and we typically make money uh, so the city's out nothing. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, mileage, per diem, hotel, any of that stuff. Um, so we were blessed for uh, Dr. Waldrop to agree to come down in October to do our certification. At that point, then everybody will be certified. But currently, right now, out of the six, one guy cannot write citations. He can file on you through the municipal, through the prosecuting attorney, which is what he does. Um, it's a roundabout way to get the same process, but it's a very lengthy, uh, cumbersome process for an officer to do. The other two are legally able to write citations because they're under that year of allowance per, per state guideline. And then us three, the other three, are already certified. So it costs nothing. Any further public comment? Steve Hampton. I, uh, after what I just heard, it seems like if we rotate employees that we could keep them uh, writing tickets. Uh, and so there needs to be a minimum, it seems to me, of, uh, of uh, time and service to, uh, to qualify because they may not even know what they're uh, get a handle on the job until after they've been there six months or so. So um, it seems like the longer you're there, you run into more qualifications. Uh, uh, so I would just ask you to consider that. Thank you. Any further comment? We'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving um, Item 6A on the public hearing on animal control. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Passes 7 0. Item 6B consider first public hearing of an ordinance amending various sections of the zoning ordinance in the Code of Ordinances regarding the definition of and regulations applicable to schools, including establishing different standards for kindergarten through ninth grade and high schools, defining both public and private schools as a school, and establishing development standards for schools, including requirements for parking, vehicle stacking, and site development. John? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Um, this is an item that's come up a few times uh, in the past couple of years. Um, so I want to give a, just a very brief history about how schools are regulated under the city's <laughs> zoning ordinance. Prior to 2000, the ordinance allowed schools basically uh, anywhere uh, within the city, uh, with the exception uh, of the downtown. Um, 
in 2000, that was changed basically to make it more difficult to place a school in a residential area. And I think the idea was if you're, if you're putting something like a school uh, in the middle of a neighborhood, perhaps rezoning to a commercial zoning district or something uh, was, was maybe more appropriate. Uh, we've seen that cause problems with the school district, however, because most of the schools, especially elementary schools, are in residential zoning. So every time they come in to uh, expand a classroom building, build a new building, uh, they have to come through a separate process, either create a planned development district for the school site, uh, rezone it to something else, or seek an expansion of a nonconforming use. So what this change would do is basically change the way schools are regulated uh, under the zoning ordinance, basically going not quite as far back as it was prior to 2000, but in that direction of generally allowing schools in most zoning districts. One of the things we looked at, though, was uh, separating K through 9 versus high schools. Since high schools are, are, are bigger, uh, typically the students drive, and so you have different kinds of uh, aspects of parking and traffic and things that don't apply to elementary schools and middle schools. So we, we split those out, and those K through 9 would be allowed in all the residential districts uh, and non-residential districts with a couple of exceptions, and those are uh, the mobile home, um, general commercial, heavy commercial, office warehouse, and the manufacturing districts. But otherwise, they would be allowed in all those districts, including uh, a residential neighborhood. Uh, high schools would be allowed in, those would still be only allowed in those commercial districts. Um, and then finally, high schools in a residential zone could still be allowed, but with a conditional use. So they wouldn't be allowed by right, but they would still have to come to the Planning Commission uh, for approval. Uh, we also looked at one of the issues we think that the reason the, the ordinance was changed in 2000 was because of the, some of the negative impacts of schools. So, for example, uh, an elementary school right across the street from homes might have uh, traffic issues, or if they have a sign, there might be issues with that. And so we went back and looked at uh, what many of those items that had been addressed over the years, and we created a, a list of standards for the development of schools. And I won't read through all of these, but it, it addresses things like the street in front of the school, parking, traffic, um, crosswalks, those kinds of things. Uh, it also addresses some things that give schools a little bit more authority than, than what they would normally have in a residential district, for example, height. Uh, right now, the height limit in a single-family zoning district is 35 feet. This would allow schools up to 45 feet. Um, same with signs. Signs are very limited in a residential district, but this allows schools to have more of a commercial size sign uh, rather than being limited to the smaller signs uh, normally allowed in residential. Uh, most of the requirements of this would apply with either a brand new school or expansions over 50 percent. Uh, and this one example is the vehicle stacking spaces. Uh, that would be addressing uh, basically a queuing lane uh, for people to drop off kids uh, at schools. An existing school that doesn't have that wouldn't have to come in and do it because of this, but only if they're expanding significantly or completely demolishing a building and rebuilding on the site. Uh, there, I wanted to include this just because sometimes parking is one of the questions we get on schools. Uh, this ordinance before you does not change those parking standards for schools, but um, as you can see, elementary schools don't require near as many spaces uh, as, say, a high school or a college or university. We are adding the stacking or queuing uh, lane requirement. That's not currently a requirement, so a new elementary school could be built today with no accommodation for drop-off lane and, and stacking spaces. This would, this would trigger that for new construction. Uh, so our recommendation is for you to approve this uh, minor amendment to the zoning ordinance. Staff does recommend approval, as did the Planning Commission, by a 6-0 vote. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for John? Charlotte? I just have a question with reference to, say, Central High School. You know, they'll buy a, a house, tear it down, and make additional parking, and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, that's permissible. As their staff, if their enrollment grows and they need additional parking, I mean, that's permissible, right? Well, it is. They would have to, if the the property is zoned residential, they would either have to rezone it or get the conditional use. Uh, under our ordinance, 
parking for a use, like a, whether it's a school or a, a commercial business, um, the parking for that use has to have the same zoning as the use itself. Move to approve is, uh, wait, uh, Tommy, did you have? When you talk about the 50%, does talk a little bit about Angelo State. Um, they are under a, doing a lot of construction. When, when we're talking about expanding by more than 50%, what 50% of what? Of the, generally it's the total buildings on the site. Now having said that, Angelo State being um, a state entity is not subject to most of our zoning type regulations. Okay. There are a few exceptions to that, but for the most part, this would not apply. And, and when this talks about college, it would be for a you know, small private college or something like that if it were to come okay. uh, into town. Obviously, this is the first reading, but have you heard from any homeowners, uh, residential um, individuals who have issues with these new this new language? No, not not directly as as it relates to this. I think our hope is that with the standards we've created, uh, new schools or big expansions of schools will will be able to address those concerns that we typically would hear from neighbors. But it, as this has gone through, we have not heard from neighbors uh, with this ordinance amendment. Any other questions, comments? Charlotte, were you going to make a motion? Yes, I was. Move to approve as presented. I'll second. Any public comment? I'm Chris Giroux. Uh, I think you've got a problem. Um, you're, you're stating that ninth grade is not high school. And in San Angelo, both Central and Lakeview have ninth grade as high school. So you can't have K through nine under one thing and then high school. So I think somebody needs to change that from ninth grade to eighth grade. I can address that. We we actually had some discussions and in our, I should have said earlier that we met with the school district and, and coordinated a lot of this with them. And really that was done for the central freshman campus. The concern is that if we call that high school, um, then some of the parking standards that would apply don't really apply because most ninth graders don't drive. Uh, and so driving typically kicks in around 10th grade. Uh, and so that was specifically worded K through nine to address um, Central Freshman Campus. Uh, and where, where a school would have ninth and the other high school all in one, um, they would be treated basically proportionally. So the number of classrooms that are ninth grade classrooms, the ninth grade parking standard would apply. Uh, the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade classrooms, the uh, higher standard for parking would apply. Okay. Any further public comment? Jamie Lee Tabor. Uh, I just, um, after him talking about the freshman campus and everything, Shannon takes up nearly every bit of their parking. You know, that's just something to think about under this subject matter because I walk everywhere <laughs> and uh, I just, I'm trying to think and listen at the same time, but. Uh, that freshman campus doesn't have much parking because of Shannon Medical taking up nearly, you know, all of their parking and everything. Any further public comment? Can I call for a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. Item 6C, consider first public hearing of an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance and the code of ordinances regarding, quote, off-street parking standards, end of quote, by establishing a process for an alternative parking plan and providing standards for off-site and reduced parking. John, you're on. Thank you. Uh, again, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is actually... Uh, Oftentimes we bring to you ordinance amendments that, that increase regulation or strengthen regulations or, or those kinds of things. This is actually adding additional flexibility and benefit to 
uh, businesses based on concerns that we've heard. Um, and you, you heard one earlier uh, today in the, the public comment section. Uh, basically what this does is give us, uh, basically me as the planning director, uh, additional flexibility to authorize uh, reduced parking for a business or, or any other use without them having to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Today, uh, if, if your business requires 20 parking spaces and for whatever reason you want to only provide 15, you may have a perfectly logical reason for that. Um, but today you have to apply and go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment to get a variance for that. This would allow an, uh, an alternative uh, parking uh, scenario. Now, I, I don't want people to hear that and think, well, all you have to do is say I, I want to provide 15 parking spaces instead of 20, and, and so approve it. Uh, you'll have to base that on some sort of justification, and the ordinance uh, has some criteria that we'll look at to do that. Uh, but we, we run across this. It's not terribly frequently, but uh, every few months we'll have an issue with a business that – uh, there are some parking uh, issues. Uh, we just had one that went to the Zoning Board of Adjustment yesterday, in fact, for a student-based uh, facility on or near the ASU campus. And, you know, given that their clientele is almost exclusively students, uh, that was the perfect example where they really didn't need all of the parking that our ordinance would normally say that they need. And so that, that was an option. Had, had they come in after this, uh, we would have had some additional flexibility without them having to go through the Zoning Board of Adjustment and, and wait another month uh, to get that approval. So um, I should say this last bullet here, too. It still does allow them, if, if I say no at an administrative level and say, well, no, I don't think that's good justification for less parking, uh, it still allows them to go through that variance process with the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Uh, really, this does two different things. It allows uh, for off-site parking. So if you have an arrangement with a, a business or a parking lot that may be a block away, uh, as long as it's within 400 feet, you would be able to count that parking uh, for your required parking. Today, any required parking for a business or any other use has to be on the site uh, of the business. Uh, and with, with few exceptions, you can't count parking that may be down the street. Um, you also can't, uh, well, it's difficult to count shared parking. And so, for example, a, an office building and a movie theater or a church that most of their parking is on Sunday, uh, you know, another use that might share parking with them uh, might have a peak use on a different day. And so we can take that into account, something that our, our ordinance uh, standards currently uh, don't allow us to do. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, an alternative parking plan for reduced parking. Uh, an example of that I've seen in another city was a, a bike shop. They say some of the people come to our bike shop on bike, and we give bike racks in front of the in front of the store. We don't need as many car parking spaces because of that. And so that's an example where we could uh, approve less parking uh, for that site. So um, this does come with staff's recommendation for approval and unanimous recommendation from the Planning Commission. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Would you define again the standard for determining the amount of parking spots required by business? Well, it varies. Uh, it's typically based on a square footage. So uh, one parking space per 300 square feet or 500 square feet, uh, depending on the type of business. Uh, in some cases, it's based on the number of employees. Uh, we have a chart in our use chart that's probably four or five pages long. And so there's no one answer, but it, it does vary by the type of business. Do I have additional questions, comments from council? I guess Pardon? I'm a little confused. Uh, what if, in, say, you had a business, a restaurant, and you require so many parking spaces, uh, and a different business moves into the building next to you, and it's a bicycle shop. Do you use the same standards for parking as you do for restaurants? No, a re retail use would have a different standard for parking, and that's typically based on the square footage of the building. Um, a restaurant is typically based on the number of seats, the capacity, number of tables, that sort of thing. And so uh, if a business changes from a restaurant to a retail use, there would be a new parking calculation. And, and typically in that direction, a restaurant would have plenty because restaurants typically require more parking than uh, another retail use. It's sometimes problematic for a business that maybe buys a retail 
site and wants to convert it to a restaurant, oftentimes they find themselves short of parking and have to address that. Another question? Any further? To approve. Second. All in uh, public comment? Uh, today, does that uh, include my parking? <laughs> because um, uh, I don't know what else to do. Uh, we, need, you know, I wish that y'all would consider uh, that. That's just going to be an in and out parking. I keep, I do all, you know, the upgrading, cutting the grass and cutting everything in front of the establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, I do everything I can, you know, for the city. There's nobody next to me. You know, uh, that man always lets us park there, you know, because I take care of his yard. So I hope that this would, uh, y'all would consider passing this for me today because I'm trying to do something good for the city. And uh, I know that everybody in the city council and your mayor have a heart and deep inside, I hope you all think that I want to do something good for this city. That's all I want. And God bless y'all, and I hope you pass this. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Uh, I may offend this lady that's sitting here, but uh, I have been to Freedom Fellowship's pantry before and a freedom fellowship has plenty of money plenty of finances and it shouldn't have to come out of the city's pocket and uh and i mean when i've been there there's been no problem down south chaperon and south oaks one bit of traffic yes ma'am they uh look for me to open that food pantry because it's overgrown uh, and uh, they're using it for the school freedom fellowship is using that building for the school and during the time that uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays there's a lot of confusion and there ha they think that somebody can be running the people that are getting out from school when school's there so it's going to be very much improved. I, I plan to be involved with this, you know, so it can be a success too because um, a lot of people, you know, they see things, but they don't know that it's uh, how it really is in the inside. See, they have all that people that go to the school, and that's why they needed another food pantry because they already outgrew it. And that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I can quickly answer Ms. Martinez's question. This change would not directly affect her property. It wouldn't approve her situation, but she would be eligible to apply for this parking alternative. I'll just add that we've met with, uh, staff has met with Freedom Fellowship. Uh, given them their options, uh, describe the Zoning Board of Adjustment variance process that's already available to them. Uh, and so our expectation was that that was the route they were going to proceed, but this would uh, be an option available to them as well. All right. Any further comment? Then I'll ask for a vote um, for um, item 6C as written and as presented by John James. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7 0. Item 6D Consider first public hearing of an ordinance amending Chapter 2, Administration and Personnel, Article 2.07, Boards, Committees, and Commissions, Division 14, Civic Events, Board of the Code of Ordinances. And Sydney, you're here to talk to us. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Good morning. My name is Sydney Walker. I'm the Civic Events Manager. Uh, we're just presenting a recommendation from our Civic Events Board in regards to uh, the ordinance um, to revise and update the regulating um, that's regulating our board. All provisions are administrative in nature. Um, very basic information. Looking at the qualifications, changing them from 21 years of age to the voting age. Also, thank you. 
looking for the terms, uh, changing them from October 1st to January 1, and having term limits. Uh, also the duties, removing the auditorium, and the quorum would uh, downsize from five to four members, and absent members can only miss three meetings. Do I have questions from city make council? A, make a comment, Brenda. Uh -huh. I think this is a very good start for all the boards and commissions. I applaud the Civic Events Group for, for taking this step. I would like to see something very similar for the rest of the boards and commissions. So uh, if Brian and Teresa, if we can, we can take a look at that, I'm very much in favor of this. As a matter of fact, I'll vote for motion to approve as presented. I have a question. Yes, Charlotte. The term limits, uh, changing it January 1, I mean, everything has been October because that's the city's fiscal year. Uh, yes, ma'am. The board has asked to, uh, asked to move the, uh, the date from October 1 to January 1 due to a few meetings that were missed this year. So they would like to be, the president would like to be on the board at least for a year. What's the com uh, would, would you repeat again what the complication is? Well, the, he was. We actually started. Of course, is uh, actually October one. They would like to move it to January first because we had missed the meetings in November and December, and that we he did he wouldn't have his whole full term if if it wasn't on January one if it wasn't moved. And so the board has decided that for all the uh, they would like to be able to do all the voting for. Uh, the president and vice president of the board to January 1st. So do they historically not have those meetings in November no, sir. or December? Yes, sir. We, we've, the... we didn't vote beforehand on in October. Um, and so we're just trying to clean up, like I said, the language for it and make sure that it falls on January 1st because that's when we, we normally would like to do our votes. Or they would. So basically it's just a board preference. Yes. <laughs> So does that mean that you're wanting three meetings plus November and December? Does, or does it change the, the three, need? Are you talking about the three meetings at the bottom, Mel? If the, yeah. if the, the absent cancels members. the meeting, then that would not count as an absence. If yes. they choose not to hold that meeting, which is what I think he's saying yes, is historically happening on those months or months that, that they don't hold a meeting. So that wouldn't count as an absence. But you're absent. Uh, members at uh, three meetings. I mean, if they are uh, approved absence, that's you know, it doesn't count in as one of your three. No, ma'am. Correct. It's pretty, it's just pretty liberal. Unexcused abs absence ex is when they just don't show up and don't tell anyone that they're call. not going to be there. The Harry's point, sh I guess this would be for. Teresa Bryan, do, should we look at having a standard for all boards and commissions that whatever would would be most appropriate, we could take a recommendation from you all to say um, at some, you know, we don't have to, obviously we're not voting on that today, but to something. We are looking at all the boards and commissions um, as part of our ordinance review and updating, and Brian and I would love to have as much of that s standard as possible. That'd be great. The qualification on the voting age, you want it to be voting age, not 21, and describe why you would want to lower that. Because one, again, we want to go back and make sure that people that are put on these boards and commissions truly have some background, some life experience to be able to efficiently be a participant on the board, and our, that's important. Our board feels that if, if you can't run for council at the age of 18, that you should be allowed to be on the board at the age of 18 as well. Any other questions? So this could have the potential, if we do this, depending upon recommendation from staff, this could have the potential, possibly, of changing again to another date. But just be This that is the first reading. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. I, I just, the only problem I've got is the terms changing it to January 1. I just think that everything in the city should be consistent with our, our fiscal year, uh, yes, especially when it comes to budgeting and the folks that work that budget and prepare 
going into the fiscal year instead of lagging November, December, in well, actually October, November, and December, be you know a three month lag or confusion. It is taken some time to get used to the fiscal year being October, you know, instead of January one, and I, I just see it as worth opening a can of worms, and that's my only problem with this. I agree, and I think that the reality is, is people can ask to be absent or notify absent, so it doesn't get in the way of somebody being a, a good citizen or com, um, a board member. Changing the rules shouldn't change expectations. Yes, ma'am. Harry, I think you had a question. Yeah, I, I really, I think I need some clarification because I've served on some of these boards before I was on council. And January 1 was the date on, on some of these other boards. What I'm trying to find is consistency here. It's not October 1 just because it follows the, the city's fiscal year. I mean, Fort Concho, for example, is, is always been January 1. So I know that some of those, those uh, boards and commissions truly have different dates. Let's just get consistency. And I think January 1 is really the time frame that we, we need to take a look at. Lucy, you had... Yes. Uh, Sydney, on the terms, how long is this, uh, the terms for the civic board? Three years. Three years? Yes, ma'am. Three years. We could, I mean, again, Mary, you mentioned this is the first public reading. Uh, we could approve and have staff take a look at uh, the terms as far as January 1st, October 1st, kind of have a better idea of when those terms actually uh, start for some of those other boards since we're talking about standardizing. Right now, there is no standard okay. uh, across boards. We have some that are in April, some that are in January, some that are in October. Uh, it would be nice from a staff perspective for management to move to a standard of either October or January. We don't really have a preference uh, as far as I'm concerned, but whatever works for the majority of boards. So we could approve at this point and come back at the next meeting and kind of a little bit of research and say this is what we discovered and this is our recommendation. We, we can't. I think, I mean, I think this is probably a good template if everybody's, uh, if everybody accepts this, then we can move towards standardizing other boards in, in relation to this first step. So do I have a motion? A second? Second. Um, and public comment, please. Yes, my name is Jim Turner. Uh, the whole subject of boards keeps coming up periodically. About five years ago, in fact, uh, they voted on a procedure to help standardize, monitor, and keep better communication with the board, but it was never fully implemented. One of the things that has to be remembered on the date for these boards, some of these boards, like the Zoning Board, the Civil Service Commission, and a few others, I'm sure, have by state law a requirement that the first meeting in January is when they elect the president. So if you have the appointment happen in October and, and the old president is no longer there, you effectively don't have a president unless you have a special election for those three months up until January and then you have another election required in January. So that creates turmoil also. One of the other things that was looked at was do we want to be trying to decide basically two dozen board members, because that's how many each council member normally would have to deal with, all in one short time frame in a month. It may be good to spread that out to have some of these boards done quarterly instead of having every board done in January or October or anything because you're going to have a, if nothing else, one of the first meetings you're going to have or the last meeting you have in December deciding who's going to be on all of these boards come January 1st. And that puts an awful lot of pressure on the council members because they have to know what every one of these people is doing. And one of the problems I'm seeing with boards is there's often poor communication between the board members and the people that appoint them. It's very hard to keep that communication going. And if you take and have all of them done at once, 
and you don't have a lot of time to do the selection process right, that's not a good thing either. Thank you. If, if I might address that yes, concern, yes. Uh, one of the things that alleviates Mr. Turner's concern is the fact that most boards, whether they're two-year terms, three-year terms, four-year terms, they're staggered terms, so it wouldn't be every, every member coming up every January. So that would alleviate some of that. But he is right. It would be more in January, um, but I don't, I don't see it as a, a game changer. I don't believe that the all boards have to have the same January 1 or October 1. I think that there are instances where perhaps there are state regulations that could influence um, decisions. And I also know that even though you elect somebody in October, you, they, are the, they have a term limit that ends December 31st with a new president coming on January 1, and that's as an incoming president what would happen. So I don't think you're without somebody leading the the board for two months. They might not, as they say, lame duck mentality, but the reality is is an election does not um, take someone immediately off of an officer position. They stay on the board until the incoming president's term starts January 1, et cetera. Correct? Or not? We, we could address that uh, that way in the ordinances. Um, there is also, like currently, the way we do the mayor pro tem. If the council changes, typically we take a vote for the mayor pro tem, but then when it changes again, if there's a runoff, then we would take another one. And that was, you kind of saw that in the last meeting and then at the meeting in, in July. So there's multiple ways to handle that, multiple ways to make that work. Uh, we just... Yes. You have comment, Teresa? No, I was just saying we probably should get back on topic with this specific Got ordinance it. amendment. So I have a motion and a second to approve as written the first. Have, oh, sorry, that. Billy, come on up. Dear, I didn't see you. My apologies. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor, Council. I'm Billy DeWitt, and I stand in support of the um, age qualification being reduced to 18. I had an opportunity to meet with a group of young students last week. And one of the first questions they had for me, since they know that I'm you know, running for a position on city council is, well, what could the city council do for somebody my age? And um, so you know, it generated discussion about the decisions that the council makes that actually impact our young people. And um, there was another young man there who has lived in Midland, and he talked about the different opportunities for 18-year-old high school students um, to per or college students to participate in city government, city leadership. So, um, you know, I'm not saying, well, I think certainly that the Civic Events Board could regulate the number of 18-year-old or high school students that would participate, and they would have the guidance and the leadership from more senior staff that have the life experiences about making good decisions. You know, we see so many of our young people now saying, San Angelo has nothing to offer me. I'm leaving. But I think we need to be working, and here may be an opportunity for us to work to get our young people involved to help them gain some leadership skills so that when it's their time to take the positions up there on the podium, they could do it. So I support 100% reducing that age from 21 to 18. Thank you. Any further public comment? Steve Hampton. I. Um, I think you've hit. Uh, you've had two uh, topics this uh, morning come up before you that need uh, to be uh, thoroughly discussed. Uh, you you mentioned a while ago that uh, well, this is the first reading. Well, th this is probably on the only good hearing that we'll we'll get on this because the second reading is run through on your consent agenda, and and unless it's. Uh, um, caught and, and, and singled out, uh, it will go right on through without um, um, a great deal of discussion. So um, I, uh, I would uh, ask that you monitor those consent agendas uh, a little closer and, and don't allow these things. Like I said before, there's a reason why uh, we um, 
need to have our second readings discuss on, on many things. Uh, also, uh, another thing that since we're jumping on board uh, with the uh, discussions of these uh, committees and the changing the rules, uh, one thing uh, that needs to be, uh, uh, and, and Jim uh, brought it up that uh, a couple of years back they uh, brought up uh, trying to get the uh, greater, encourage greater feedback on our committees uh, to the council uh, and we need to, I believe that we do need to uh, <clears throat> get that uh, started where they return and report report on a regular basis at least once a year uh, and uh, give us a discussion on uh, how they think their committee is going and uh, what ru rules they might want to change and uh, and have the presidents do it instead of the staff. We we need to hear from the, uh, the leaders themselves instead of uh, just the staff always. And uh, so a return and report uh, is needed uh, uh, at least once a year, and I appreciate your time. Any further public comment, Sydney? Mr. Sydney, you're good with this. Yes, ma'am. As long as you are. Then we should take a vote. All in favor of approving the first reading of 6D as written, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7-0. Item 60, update and discussion of fleet data monitoring and the GPS system. Ryan. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, Ryan Kramer, Superintendent of Fleet Services. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring to you this morning uh, an update on our data monitoring system. Um, it was uh, uh, a pleasure to see uh, some of the results as a, as a fleet person um, getting to dive into data um, is intriguing. Um, so let me show you quickly um, a couple of just a little historical information because we have so many new members of our council. Um, our, our original plan uh, was um, approved by council uh, December of 2016 uh, for to start this project uh, to for GPS installation. Um, our basic premise here was that uh, we would install uh, these devices on uh, on-road vehicles as well as a select group of off-road uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, our main objectives were to simply monitor vehicle health and maintenance, um, continue to maintain as accurate a fleet record as possible, um, of course monitor driver behavior where necessary, uh, reducing liabilities, increasing accountability, and ultimately evaluate our fleet utilization and effectiveness. And so uh, as the goals of this program, I think that we'll see here shortly that, um, that we've done well in those. Our timeline is, is here on the screen. Um, we began installation February of 2016 after the council approval in December. Um, by May of 2016, we had uh, the majority of our fleet equipped. We did elect to uh, postpone equipment of the water and sewer funds until the next fiscal year. Um, so in October, we began that. Uh, by March 2017, our fleet is virtually 100% equipped uh, as identified uh, for vehicles that we could gain data from. And our original intent was to come back approximately one year later of our uh, main fleet installation to, to report on the information that we've seen. The original uh, council approval was um, for uh, $131,000 in annual fees. This is per device. It's similar to a cell phone contract, if you will. Um, the hardware cost was uh, approved at $66,000, just over $66,000. Uh, to date, uh, we've installed uh, 30 less units than we originally anticipated. I'll show you why in just a moment. And we've spent just under $61,000 on the hardware, and our annual costs are approximately $125,000, and that's due to the 30 less units that, that we've actually installed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of the main attributes here, uh, and again, keep in mind, these are things that we are seeing across our fleet. Uh, the first includes driver behavior and liability, and, and here we're talking about idle time monitoring, speeding events, braking, 
uh, heart acceleration. These things affect our fleet equipment drastically uh, as a whole. Um, and, and of course, we're looking to identify risky behaviors with operators in, in an effort to reduce accidents and liability. Um, for fleet utilization, our, our goal, as always, is to maintain a highly utilized fleet. Uh, we don't want an overused fleet because we're going to experience increased failures, uh, but we also don't want any equipment sitting still doing nothing, as that's an increased cost as well. Uh, so, so by using the program, we're able to justify um, equipment requests <clears throat> due to uh, the equipment that's being overutilized, for example, a mower that we don't have enough of, mowing parks. Um, likewise, we can also identify equipment that is not being used as much as it should, perhaps repurpose that somewhere else, which will help eliminate replacement costs. Uh, we've also used this to help increase our pool uh, of equipment. That is a, a group of equipment that we've identified as a high need, but only a random need by divisions. Uh, so we keep all those on one site and allow that equipment to be borrowed at, at uh, a scheduled interval. Operator accountability for monitoring miles driven and routing. Of course, we want our employees to, to get to an event as soon as possible to satisfy a citizen complaint or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also looking for uh, work production efficiencies, and again, this has to do with uh, not finding that they're doing something wrong, but figuring out how long things take us to do uh, to help justify costs, employees, equipment, et cetera. And of course, maintaining those fleet records. That's a critical nature of our fleet. Um, we are over 900 units in our fleet, which is a large fleet. Um, and, and many of those records um, are improved greatly by having data at our fingertips as we do now. Plus, we are um, uh, consistently gathering uh, values uh, related to the operation of the equipment. For example, uh, cost per mile, um, cost per hour, uh, depending on how it relates to that equipment. So we did uh, perform a small case study as we began implementation. Um, we wanted to set a baseline for ourselves. We wanted to know how we did or did not do. Yes, ma'am. Ron, just for clarification, I understood you to say that this was approved in uh, December 16, but it was actually 2015 that it was approved. Is that not correct? Yes, ma'am. I believe you're correct. I'm sorry. That's, I just, yes. just for the record, it was December 2015. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And then we did start installation February 2. Right. Thank you for that correction. Thank you. Um, so our case study for uh, one division, we selected a division uh, that we felt had a variety of equipment that we could get a good feel for. Um, we installed devices on the stormwater division, uh, in essence, without the operators knowing that they were there in order to develop a baseline of data. We, we didn't want to catch them in doing things. We wanted to see what our fleet is doing and how we can address it. Uh, we also wanted to know what is going to change uh, once operators are, are notified. And so we did that 30 days later. Um, and here are some of the, the details. Uh, once we did notify them, we kind of trained them on our expectations, what we were looking for. Uh, we, we encouraged them in different ways to improve. Uh, notice that our speeding events were um, almost none to start with. Uh, that's not unusual. Um, our, we have a great group of operators out there in multiple divisions. Uh, so we had one verifiable speeding event um, and then none the next month. Uh, and let me skip forward just a little bit here. I apologize, the, the numbers don't show on, those, uh, on that bar graph, but we did reduce our idle time in this division 32%. Uh, once the division was notified. The number actually looks uh, at 196 hours for the blue column. That was in February of idle time. That was reduced uh, it, it, almost immediately in the next month to 133 hours, so a 32% reduction of idle hours there. Um, the division did note uh, some specific benefits that were of benefit to them directly. Um, those include what's listed here, time tracking so that they knew where their operators were and what they were doing, uh, their locations, uh, how to dispatch them better uh, to events or calls or any other situation where they needed to get the closest operator as quickly as possible as well as operator performance in that job function. So whatever, it, whatever they were doing, they wanted to know how they were doing there. Um, one other comment that was made to me by the stormwater folks uh, were that they can now utilize the program to monitor their equipment that perhaps is left off of the department's location. So if they are mowing a large area and they leave their equipment off site, uh, potentially we have some concern for vandalism or other liability there. 
having a machine w equipped with a device like this allows them to monitor both in the evenings, early morning, middle of the night if they need to. We set alerts up for uh, key on, so we, we're not concerned uh, nearly as much as we were. This helps reduce our travel times, getting to the work site first thing in the morning. It may take us 30 minutes to an hour to get there, uh, depending on the equipment. And it uh, reduces wear on the equipment, for example, tires. That's a big one uh, on a tractor if we're driving it across town. Um, so uh, just a quick rundown of improvements across the fleet that we have seen. Uh, we have eliminated uh, some of our fleet because of this program. We've just identified equipment that we did not uh, need any longer or we weren't using it well. We either repositioned that equipment or we eliminated it completely through surplus auction. Uh, to date, uh, I'm aware of 49 units that we have done that with. That's approximately 5% of our fleet. We started at 1,000 units right before this program began uh, and we're right at 951 uh, as per these numbers. Uh, that is an estimated reduction of just over $2.1 million in value. This would be replacement value. So this is if we had to go replace these pieces of equipment, these 49, uh, we've eliminated the need to do that because we no longer need them for whatever reason. And that's the value of those units if we were to go to replace them. We've also seen a reduction in service calls. This includes uh, dead batteries or other breakdowns that, uh, that call us out of the shop for repairs. Um, we've seen a huge uh, fleet awareness uh, mentality increased uh, where we all know what the fleet is doing and why and, and what our numbers look like, our idle times, our drive times, et cetera. And we have also eliminated towing costs as this program offers a free roadside assistance. So that's been completely eliminated. The division of benefits uh, from the division specifically um, do include ways that they can help their budget directly, their expense budget. Um, if we can reduce idle time, we reduce fuel consumption, for example. We also can monitor those costs associated with specific jobs. So if we're a department that is billing out our work, um, we can correctly identify how much that is actually costing us to perform that job function. Uh, we've also identified operator behaviors that are positive and we can uh, encourage those operators and congratulate them, make examples out of them um, in doing such a great job. Operator locations and response times, again, in routing, getting to those job sites uh, are all critical in nature. Um, Citywide, one year later, what we're seeing is we have seen a reduction of about 2,600 gallons of unleaded fuel used per month. Um, and about 1,900 gallons less per month of diesel. And so we are seeing some fuel consumption savings there. And you should note that it's related to, as you saw in the case study, that, that difference, that 32% idle reduction, but it's also dealing with miles driven and routing performance. Um, again, we've seen departments uh, reduce their idle time, including lake operations and the airport by significant amounts. Um, we've reduced our miles driven across uh, the fleet. We've seen multiple divisions with improved routing, uh, getting their, their crews, especially with multiple pieces of equipment, to those job sites quickly as some of that equipment takes uh, considerable time to move. Um, reduced fuel consumptions across departments, uh, speeding reductions and idle time awareness, just making our departments aware of that information, our operators, has proved to be beneficial. We've also seen divisions uh, beginning to train their operators in proper routing, proper techniques while on those job functions because they realize where they're missing out. Uh, perhaps we have an operator that gets to a location that takes a little longer than the last guy did. Um, we can encourage and train and, and properly get that operator where they need to go um, with some encouragement and some, some motivation there as well as the safety aspect, um, our, uh, driving slower, uh, being more mindful that you, you have the potential to be seen have improved our safety aspects. Uh, moving forward, um, as council approved at our last meeting, we are beginning to integrate multiple components with this system, uh, or I should say this system with those other components. One of those is the fuel system that was approved at the last meeting. Um, we will be pulling data from the, the data monitoring system, incorporating it with our fuel system in order to uh, better maintain our records and get fueling done faster, more accurately. 
Um, we have reduced, the company actually, Network Fleet, has reduced uh, what's known as the ping rate. That's just simply how often we come into contact with that vehicle, how often we reach out and grab the data. We went from two minutes to one minute, uh, so we're getting much more data. Uh, than we were at uh, better intervals. Our mapping is always being improved and we're working to improve our diagnostic capabilities as an organization by pulling in data from the GPS and data monitoring system into our work management system. Uh, we will continue to um, uh, train our managers and operators. As a matter of fact, we'll be involved, our staff, our fleet services staff, including myself, will be involved in new employee orientation. We did visit all divisions when uh, their assigned fleet was equipped with the device and trained on what to expect and, and expectations that we're looking for. Um, and so we'll continue to do that with new operators coming in. We will also be developing, as now we know exactly what we're looking for, uh, we'll be developing standardized information, working with city management to make sure that this is on track for what we're looking for, uh, mostly which deal with idle time, uh, how we handle speeding events and uh, fleet utilization, again, to encourage a highly utilized fleet and to make sure that we have absolutely the equipment and the, in the quantities that we need. Um, on the idle event, we've uh, just as an example of, of the things that we've looked at, um, we've noticed that we have a considerable amount of idle time that we can't do anything about. Uh, for example, a vehicle in the street, uh, I can't ask, uh, the division managers won't ask their operators to turn the vehicles off because we have our safety lighting on. If we turn them off in 30 minutes to an hour, the vehicle will be dead. That's completely counterproductive and potentially uh, with those batteries going dead, our lights turn off, which is a, a huge safety issue. We've identified a device that will help us save there $800 and in uh, a reasonable amount of time, depending on the usage of that equipment, uh, we have a demo unit in service now that will pay for itself in 13 months and that equipment isn't used as heavily as some of the others are. So in some of these areas, we've identified Identified, we're going to be making movements um, in, in some of those realms to try to find solutions. Uh, this one costs a little bit of money, but there are others that we can do internally that will help the situation. So if I could answer any questions. Brenda. Yes, sir. I'm the one that asked for this. Uh, I was actually a citizen in, in the room and came forward uh, when we were considering, when the council was considering this. Uh, as a fleet manager and a prior job, uh, I, I really encourage the council to go ahead and make this investment, uh, but I wanted to see where we were with it. Uh, I think we've done a good job. We've got about $100,000 in, in, in fuel savings uh, based on the numbers you just gave me, uh, and I think that we really are taking advantage of, of, of the capabilities of this. Uh, I certainly appreciate this. I would encourage that we do this a couple times a year so that we, we see where, we, where our improvement is and how we're making this happen. Um, I love the, being able to talk numbers, and so it's great to see the $2.1 million in savings with the 49 uh, uh, fleet not required. But give me some other numbers. What's the dollar savings in fuel? You talked about a lot of items where there were savings. And so one would want to know what those calculate to other than bullet points. What is the savings? Because as we get ready to go into budget session, we want to make sure that we understand the savings from one year to the next on all the specific categories. Sure. And, and let me say this, that um, some of these categories are easy to identify in dollars. Uh, fuel is a great example. Um, uh, there are some others that are quite a bit more difficult and take a lot more legwork and potentially uh, would encourage some criticism on how we got there. Um, however, uh, again, we've seen um, our work orders reduced for breakdowns by 8% in 12 months. Um, if we can continue that reduction, we are getting um, vehicles in and out of our facility faster. That is an item that is difficult to put a value on, but we do know that our vehicles sitting still, a standard vehicle costs us approximately $100 per day. So if I can get those vehicles in and out of my facility or any other facility from sitting still, uh, then we're saving those dollars, and so we, we push for that. So a reduction in uh, work orders, is, is this the case, um, that will ultimately reduce uh, our costs related to idle equipment. 
Again, we mentioned the cost, uh, the excessive fuel that we're saving uh, at this point. Again, uh, depending on the value of that fuel at any given time, if we're at $2 a gallon, for example, um, then we would be saving in those quantities there. Um, some idle reduction numbers that we've seen from divisions. I mentioned airport and lake operations. Uh, the airport has saved uh, 58 hours per month of idle time. Uh, the lake operations has seen 95 hours of idle time reduced. Uh, the way we calculate that in the fleet world is uh, one hour is approximately 33 miles um, in engine usage. Uh, and so uh, by eliminating idle time, we are eliminating the need for maintenance to be done. We're eliminating uh, warranty expirations because we've uh, exceeded our, our time limit or our um, odometer reading depending on the equipment. So we're seeing some savings there. Again, a hard number to give you exact numbers on what we've saved, but we know there's some real savings in saving those items. We've also seen our drive time reduced in several divisions, including uh, facility maintenance. Um, they've reduced their drive time considerably by 54 hours a month. Um, that's real dollars based on employee time not being spent driving around, but being spent on a site or at location uh, performing a job function. We've seen miles driven reduced. Uh, for example, in the engineering department, we've seen that reduced by 2,000 miles a month. Uh, those are real miles, real dollars, again, associated with maintenance costs as well as their operator times uh, getting to and from places. Perhaps they're, they're, they've seen some routing efficiencies that they've gained. Again, a difficult number to put a value on, both from the operator perspective and the fleet perspective, but still a very real number. Um, the fuel, Even though again, they might be difficult to come up with, I think we need some records in terms of these statistics because, sure. again, we as we go into budget session, we want to make sure we understand um, minimum, maximum savings, how we should be looking at a budget, and also to be able to look at it on a yearly basis. So even if you use the same standard year in and year out on an ongoing basis, we understand the flex that has to exist there, but we need documents on dollars. Any other questions or comments from council? Got one. Overall, you can justify having this and saving it and paying for itself the annual fees plus some. Um, right. I think if we just say simply that? look at uh, the dollars that we saved in the reduction of the fleet, uh, you know, these are, are units that we're not replacing again. Is that 2.1 since we've implemented this that's right. or in yes, one annual year? No, that's since, since implementation. Okay. Yes. Can you give me what the annual costs are on the, this system? Yes, approximately $125,000, and that fluctuates about $20 per, per device per month. Um, it's a little less than $20, but about $20 for a round number to calculate. Um, so as we pull units out for auction, as we replace with new units, uh, things like that, there's some fluctuation, but approximately $125,000. This obviously requires a huge amount of monitoring. Who's taking care of the monitoring? Uh, we have a staff member in my office that uh, that's one of their main job functions is to monitor. Um, she does a great job. Jennifer's her name. Um, and, and any issues that are larger in nature or considerations that we need to make fleet-wide uh, or bring to management's attention. Um, she kind of addresses those with me. We look at different reports and, and pull different data uh, regularly to evaluate different aspects of, of things that we could find to, to mine that data. Um, and so that is, that is where uh, the majority of the back end data monitoring is happening. But all of our divisions have access to this. They have had great buy-in. They're using the program. So as it relates directly to them, uh, they are pulling the data that is most effective to them and using it as such. And so whatever is monitored is specifically taken to a manager and shown the issues on an ongoing basis. If it's something that we feel the division managers might not recognize or notice, um, then yes, that is absolutely correct. We take it and say, here's, here's a group of things that we can discuss that might affect your budget specifically, um, and, and we kind of hash those out. Uh, there's often times where, where we have an interesting discussion about what we have to do this in our division because of. And so it's great insight into uh, how best to equip their fleet from my perspective as well. Would you um, remind me, um, we've got some new council members as well, what was the purchase price of this system? 
The original council approval was uh, for an annual basis of $131,602 um, with a hardware cost of 60, just over $66,000. That was the original approval amount. To date, we have spent uh, $60,957 on hardware instead of 66730 and we are spending approximately $125,000 per year instead of the 131000 I and recall uh, uh, when Harry, I believe it was, brought this forward, and this was a hard sell because several people felt that we did not need such a monitoring system. I thought that we did. I thought it would be beneficial and help improvement in dead battery time alone uh, when calls can't be completed or uh, service work orders. I think it's great, and I hope the rest of the council moving forward will continue to support it. What is the lifetime on the actual hardware? Do you have to replace every 5, 10, 15 years? No, we're not quite sure yet. The device is completely transferable, so it's not vehicle specific. So I can take it off of a Ford pickup and put it on a Chevrolet pickup without issue. Um, what, what we expect is there will be some failures along the way, just as our computers may give up on us. It's an electronic device. Um, we expect a failure there somewhere. Um, all of our devices at this point are under warranty, so it's a simple swap. Um, it, it puts us out just a little bit, but we have one or two on the shelf so that it so that we don't have the downtime. Um, but really, we we don't know exactly know what to expect. We're seeing other users of the devices, such as uh, TexDot and Odessa, City of Odessa, that uh, don't have a lot of this happening, and so. Um, it, it's nice to see that. We expect a little bit of failure and, and having to replace them, uh, but anything that needs to be upgraded right now, they're sending, I guess, through the cloud into the device and it is upgraded at that time. So we did a patch not recent, maybe a month ago, that affected our ping rates for slow moving equipment. And so it's just a simple uh, proposition of telling the company, we have this issue, can we resolve it somehow? And they work or they already have a, a fix for it and they can zap it into it. So the updates are at no cost? That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Question, Mayor? Yes, please tell me. Um, you mentioned something about City of Odessa text dot. Does the vendor have available to us, just due to our, our arrangement with them, best practices that you can access that it might be, you know, gosh, we had never really thought about something like that so that you, you can see other, other things that other folks are doing with these to be sure we are using them to the maximum um, capacity and the, the, their best ability? The vendor does offer a lot of assistance in that respect. Uh, they've given us a lot of information, including uh, reports from other organizations that have historical data. Um, quite honestly, I prefer to go direct to those sources. I, I've uh, contact City of Odessa frequently, their fleet staff over there, and we talk about things like this, about how they're using it, and they use it slightly different than we do. Um, however, any of those discussions are great benefits, and, and including different fleet managers, organizations, and meetings that are attended. Um, there's there's uh, just a considerable number of fleets out there that have a device similar to ours, whether a different brand or not, uh, and we get to talk about it, and it's great information. I, of course, bring that information back, and we discuss it as applicable to, to what we need. Yes, sir. Further questions? I believe this was just a discussion. There's no vote required. So um, if not, let's move on to I'm going to skip. Thanks, uh, well, what we were going to do uh, was go ahead and have Morgan do a presentation. She has a doctor's appointment she needs to get to, so we will move into Morgan's presentation, which is um, item G, and then we will take a break following Morgan's presentation. Congratulations, Morgan. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate y'all being flexible. I'll just take a moment of your time. Uh, what I have before you today is an amendment to the uh, fiscal year 1617 uh, budget ordinance uh, for a few items that are going to exceed that, that schedule of expenses that we're originally allocated. <laughs> so 
So if I can hit um, the high points of each of these items before you today, the first one is related to peak hours ambulance overtime. We're really getting hammered with a ton of, of ambulance runs, and Chief uh, Dunn has developed a program. Uh, we are going to capture 90,000. When we when we have more ambulance runs, we have more ambulance revenue. So we're going to capture $90,000 in that ambulance revenue, and city manager has authorized a program where we're going to authorize overtime during specific times of the day where we know we have lots of um, ambulance runs. So we're going to match that excess revenue with an excess expense to kind of put a stop gap on solving the problem this fiscal year. Uh, the next item is the Martin Luther King Transportation Enhancement um, Grant, uh, the $1,040,000 that we're getting from TxDOT. This was approved by council to apply for and accept the funds in 2012. We're just finally you know, making progress on that project and needing to budget for it at that time. So revenue equals expenditures for that one. The local match and all requirements for it are already budgeted, already in place. This is simply the grant portion that we are putting on paper now. The next item there is a small amount of $2,400 for airport concessions. Uh, the airport fund has been very lean recently and has been very diligent in looking at revenue opportunities. This is literally their vending machines uh, for customers coming through, uh, passengers coming through, but they do want to capture that $2,400 for maintenance, um, some things that they really weren't able to include in their original budget. So we wanted to let them have the uh, freedom to do that. The next item is stormwater sweepers. Um, no revenue tied to this. Uh, it's a planned use of fund balance in the stormwater fund. <clears throat> excuse me, they're responsible for funding their own equipment replacement, and so we are authorizing them to use $500,000 of their fund balance uh, to buy two sweepers uh, to stay on schedule of, of when those items should be replaced. Um, they will have sufficient fund balance even after this $500,000 drawdown. Their fund balance will be in excess of 90 days, which is kind of a best practice. Morgan, wouldn't you say that they have been saving this money for this purpose? I mean, it didn't just fall to fund balance. They, they have a plan to take those excesses and put them away so that they can pull them when the time is right to buy the equipment. That's a good point. And so this is the final year, step of a plan. Right. Each year we have revenue over expenditures in the stormwater fund specifically for equipment replacement um, as these items are, are large and can't be tackled in any one budget year. So that expense was expected? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Uh, the next item... But not before, budgeted. Right. Right. It, it's difficult to... to, to not in the original budget, but capturing it this time. And the next item there is um, debt service for the Ford Ranch. Uh, although we haven't closed on that property yet, we are going to owe um, debt service this fiscal year. Uh, so we're going to capture interest income in excess of budget of about $4,500. And then the water fund, um, debt service fund, has a little bit of fund balance. So we're going to draw that down to zero, uh, thereby funding the debt service of $310,000. That is an eligible use of the funds that are in that fund balance. The next item there is the increased health insurance contribution um, for fiscal year 17, the plan year beginning January 1st, 2017. The council authorized an increase to the employer contribution, what the city contributes for um, um, health insurance, but also an increase to the employee premiums. And so we just need to go ahead and budget for that uh, $592,000 in revenue that we'll go ahead and add to the claims expense budget that we expected that claims expense would be higher this year. So we implemented higher rates. We just needed to um, get that recorded in the budget. And that was approved by council November 15th. The um, health insurance wellness program um, in our contract with Aetna for their their servicing of our, our, our the front of the house of our health insurance items, um, they do give us ten thousand dollars per plan year for wellness type items. So since our fiscal year, as we've talked about, that our fiscal year is different than necessarily our plan year, we had 2016 Aetna funds of $10,000 that we were able to draw down and, and, and use, and then we have 2017 Aetna dollars we expect to be able to draw down of $10,000. So both plan years in this fiscal year uh, to budget for these Aetna wellness funds, this was kind of a new thing for us. Moving forward, we're going to include this in the original budget, but we wanted to be sure and uh, use this program to the best of our ability. Next item there is related to the Marta for Hirschfeld project. We did have a Marta for Hirschfeld settlement to the Development Corporation of $1.1 million, and we're needing to reinvest that in the new agreement uh, with an expense of the same. 
The next item there is also for the Development Corporation. They have an affordable housing program, and they had a sale of one of their properties, and they want to be able to capture that revenue, reinvest it in the affordable housing program to be used in the parameters that are, are laid out in that program. And the last item before you is related to air service marketing and future projects. Um, there is $1.1 million that they're able to capture in excess revenue uh, for air service marketing that was approved by the council earlier this fiscal year. Um, and some of that is also for future projects because we are getting a little low on that and want to be able to continue moving forward with um, any opportunities that come our way. So the total budget amendment before you today, oh, I apologize. I thought I had that right here is expenses of four million eight hundred seventy four thousand eight hundred ninety nine dollars move to approve is presented is there a second second is there public comment steve <laughs> Steve Hampton, I had a question on the rainwater. They were going to spend a half a million out of it, uh, but what was the total balance of that fund? The stormwater fund balance um, is currently budgeted to end the year at $1,800,000. We'll draw that down to $1,300,000. A 90-day goal for that fund is about a million dollars. So even after this reduction of $500,000, uh, there'll be about $300,000 in excess of a 90-day goal. Also, though, they, this is not the only type of equipment they plan to use and replace. So I would guess, Shane, uh, a nod would confirm that you are saving for other equipment replacement needs in that fund. Is that correct? Okay. But they're not budgeted. That's right. I think they try to stretch the equipment out as long as they can, and then they, they bring, bring these budget amendments when, they've, when they're ready to put new equipment into, into service. And, and part of the need, the street sweepers are highly specialized equipment. The lead time on ordering those um, is, is several months. And so this is in anticipation of um, later this calendar year having a need of street sweepers. We just have to get ahead of it, um, which is why we're bringing it at this time. Is there more opportunity in the concession um, for the um, airport concessions at 2400? Um, are there plenty of vending machines, not only on in the welcoming lounge area, but also on the second floor? They are looking at that very seriously because of the su success they've had with the uh, existing machines. Uh, we do have contracts for um, drinks, uh, but uh, right now they're focusing on this part of it, and I would anticipate if they continue to have this success, we would see a proposal from them in the future. What would be the criteria? Because it would look like to me that, or what I hear from people is that once they get up to go through security and go upstairs, and all of a sudden if they're waiting for a plane or whatever, there's no place to get something to drink or eat or whatever, then you got to go back down. I'll follow, up, I'll follow up with our airport director, and uh, we'll... Uh, in the absence of uh, requests, otherwise we'll get you something, get something to council in the Friday memo. And Brenda, I think there is one right before you head up the yes. escalator or stairs. When you come through this is right for the concessions right. on the secure there's side. There's more opportunity. We yeah, need to look at that. Go downstairs and then back upstairs. Yeah, you don't want to do that. And very often people wait for a while. And we need to address carry on. convenience. And so we need to look at that as an opportunity if we could. We'll discuss it and get back to you. Thank you. All right, so we've had a motion and a second to accept the budget amendments as presented by Morgan. Do we have any further comment or are we ready for a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Passes 7-0. We are now taking a break. Thank y'all. Thanks, Morgan. Uh -huh. Geo Park activity and performance, and I believe that um, Roland Pena is going to make that presentation today. Roland, or no, it's Tina, or it's somebody. <laughs> <laughs> we prefer Tina. With the financial impact at the industrial park, um, I'm Tina Deersky, the director of finance, and then Roland will come up and um, give you an update on the economic impact out there at the industrial park. 
So to start out, um, in 1982, the city purchased about 5,500 acres of land at Loop 306 and FM 380. Uh, the cost of that land was $300 and $315 per acre. In 2000, the city conveyed um, almost 407 acres of that property to the Development Corporation for a total investment by the city of $122,000 in that particular piece of property. That property is now used as the industrial park. Um, and in 1982, when the city made that purchase of the 5,500 acres, it was discussed that that future use of that land would likely be for um, an industrial park in that area. So as far as revenues out there go, um, we started out with a federal HUD grant that allowed us to do um, some improvements to phase one. Uh, we have uh, the sale of the Taylor Publishing Building at almost $2.4 million, as well as sale of land to Angelo Archives, Case Toll Solutions, Grimes, 42 San Angelo LP, Warnat Abilene LLC, Warren Cat, AEP, and Invermex. So those are all sales of just um, land out there, and um, I believe Roland will go into more detail on what those uh, lands were sold for and how they've been developed since. Just a quick quick note on the previous slide, uh, the sure. two point four million uh, associated with Taylor Publishing that included the building and the development corporation built that for and, approximately. And we'll see that as an expenditure okay. on the next slide, yes, sir. You have the total dollar value uh, of the land purchased. What was the total dollar value of the land purchased? The three hundred. So acres the city originally purchased this four hundred and seven acres that was conveyed to Co City C. Um, at a price of $300 per acre for total cost to the city of $122,000. That was conveyed at no charge to the Development Corporation in 2000 so that we could develop an industrial park. They got it for free. Say that again, I couldn't hear you, Father. <laughs> I just said they got it for free. <laughs> I just shouldn't have had my mic on. So total revenues today um, for sales at the industrial par park equal about $5.9 million. And going into our expenditures, uh, we have um, put uh, just over $1 million into phase one out there at the industrial park, as well as $51,000 and $20,000 into phases two and three. And as I said, Roland can give you a little more information on what that involved. Um, but I, And then here's the expenditure that Michael mentioned earlier, the construction of the Taylor Building, which was almost a wash of what we sold it for of about $2.4 million for total expenditures out there at the park of almost $3.5 million. And so you can see here we're in the black out there um, with revenue over expenditures of just over $2.4 million to date. With that, I'll answer any questions you might have on the financial activity at the industrial park. So on the total expense of the land, that's included in the expenditures? Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am. So the $122,000 that the city paid for the initial land purchase is not included in the expenditures because it was no cost to the development corporation. So the city could get their $122,000 back out of Coastal DC if they wanted it, perhaps. Perhaps. I would think that would need a legal opinion on the way it was conveyed, but. Okay. And all of these improvements are inclusive of every dollar spent. Yes, ma'am. We've gone back through our books. Um, as, as far as we can historically put together, uh, this is all the expenditures that we've seen at the industrial park to date. Okay. Any costs in maintaining? Any costs that, that you all incur or the city incurs with maintenance of any kind out there? I'm not aware of any maintenance costs. I would defer to Roland since that's more of an operational issue. Um, don't have that number with me. We do uh, have maintenance costs with regard to um, some of the landscaping and the signage. Uh, that, that is an area that had been neglected for a long time. We just took up that, um, that maintenance about three years ago, uh, but relatively it's uh, inexpensive. No electrical, no plumbing, no sewer, no anything costs? Just, just watering for the landscaping. And what was and, the cost of and, improving and that? And we do have an electric meter for that yeah. uh, sprinkler system for the watering. 
And the there was a an improvement on a sign out there. What was the cost for the uh, improvement of the sign? The recent improvements. Mm -hmm. I believe it was around um, fifty thousand, uh, between fifty and sixty thousand. And that went out for bid. Those are three signs. They went out for bid. Yes, ma'am. We, we did take bids. Mo uh, the majority of the bids were in the same range. The last so time, the last time that um, those signs were built back in 2002, 2003. Um, since then, the signs had not received any any additional maintenance, uh, and so that's over time. That's what it has taken to replace or remodify in terms of cost, um, that time value. So when the bid went out, it was for all three signs at the same time, not an individual sign? That's correct. And the bids came in in this range? Yes, ma'am. And who performed the sign maintenance? Who performs the sign maintenance? or Who, who did? Who, who, who got the bid? Uh, Fast Signs did. Any other questions on the financial performance at the industrial park? If not, uh, Roland has some information as far as um, what the activity out there is right now. I'll let him come up and talk. Good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Roland Pena, Director of Economic Development. Um, Thank you for this opportunity to come before you. I, I'm going to try to highlight some milestones with regard to the industrial park activity. I think it's important to note from the information that you heard from Tina that uh, out of the 126 acres that have been sold, 112.6 uh, were sold in the last three and a half years. Uh, so um, that means that we've been selling property ever since 2013 to every single year, including this year of 2017. I have a lot of information to cover, uh, but I'll try to be as brief and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. In December 2015, we received um, notification that we had uh, received a site certification status uh, through a quality site program between AEP and McCallum Sweeney. Uh, McCallum Sweeney is a site selector consulting company who's assisted the world's largest and best known companies, companies like Hertz. Michelin, Boeing, Alstom, Harley-Davidson, Nissan, and Mitsubishi. <clears throat> the certification is for the category of super park. Uh, that means it has to be greater than 500 acres and has to have at least 100 acres contiguous. It is the only super park along I-27, uh, the I-27 proposed corridor, and possibly the only super park certified along the I-14 corridor as well. The certification basically tells a company that the site has all of the required uh, infrastructure necessary for certification, and if there are any upgrades that are required, it can be, it can be accomplished within 90 days. The certifi certification includes uh, recommended target industry sectors based on the attributes of the industrial park and requirements by industry, so we meet all of those standards. Uh, McCallum Sweeney identified food and beverage processing, general machinery, and paper products manufacturing. This is a 55,000 square foot building built specifically for Taylor Publishing in 2002 by Coast DC and later sold in 2003 to a developer for uh, the number that you saw up there, uh, 2.4 million. Later in 2006, Taylor Publishing moved their operations to other parts of Texas. At the time of their closing, over 100 employees were affected, either relocating or having to seek uh, new employment elsewhere. So the building had been empty, or has been empty, 11 years until this year, when we were able to work with Principal LED to move into uh, this facility. And I'll be coming back to talk about Principal LED in a few slides as I move forward. 2013, Case, uh, Coast DC sold 20 acres to Casehole Solutions, an energy service company, 
And in 2014, uh, State Representative Drew Drarby spoke at the opening of the facility, and he spoke about the industrial park, uh, giving Coast City C recognition for their efforts in developing the park. Casehold at the time of the oil boom had about 50 employees and continues to maintain a presence in the industrial park. The facility, uh, there are two buildings there, amount to 19,000 square feet. The total appraised market value of the building and the land and, and personal property is around 4.6 million. This is actually on the tax rolls to date. In 2014, we sold nine acres to a corporate real estate company hired by FedEx Ground. Uh, had it not been for all the work that we did, did during the certification of the industrial park, I believe we would not have made this sale. In fact, uh, the company came in and said, we have a, a Fortune 5 company. This is a blind, a blind uh, purchase. We want to evaluate uh, your um, industrial park. And they asked for a lot of uh, s specific and technical information. They did a lot of due diligence and really put us to task, but had it not been uh, for the the studies that we had conducted in certifying the park. They asked for environmental. They asked for drainage studies. They asked for soil samples. And we had uh, all of that information. I think I'm very proud. We, I think, presented a good front uh, that we had our act together. Uh, the company built a 50,000 square foot building. Uh, they have uh, over 20 employees. Uh, the market value of this building, the land and personal property on the tax rolls to date is 3.5 million. So FedEx Ground uh, was in a 6,800 square foot facility located on 920 South Chadburn. That facility is still open or it's still available for market. It's still on the tax roll so we can uh, place another company <coughs> at that facility. Notice, uh, notice a trend as, as I move forward from, from FedEx. Uh, this is the, the side of the, bus of the business uh, of the industrial park. So we have industrial and business park. Uh, so we do welcome businesses, our back office operations, as well as industrial activity at the industrial park. This is a new facility for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Parole Office. Uh, it has 22 offices and 7,000 square feet. It's owned by the private sector and it will be added on the tax rolls at the end of this year. Uh, the Texas Department of Parole Office moved from a smaller space located on a Royal Drive, that's another smaller industrial park, uh, which remains on the tax roll and is now being leased by Caltech, who we also assisted in their expansion uh, activities. Warren Cat, in March we celebrated a groundbreaking of this premier and fast-growing Caterpillar uh, dealership, Warren Cat. The company broke ground on a new 32,000 square foot facility scheduled to open in the fall of this year. Uh, in fact, steel frames uh, started going up on Friday and I haven't checked over the weekend, but uh, it's exciting to see. Uh, currently, they are housed in a 4,200 square foot building on Link Road, which will remain on the tax rolls and again, available for market so that we can place someone else in that facility. The, the company currently has a labor force of 40 in San Angelo and intends to hire 14 to 15 new employees with the expansion. So the San Angelo proximity to the Klein Shell and our industry mix activity made it very attractive uh, for the success of Warren Cat. Uh, you can see uh, by the photo, you may be able to make out uh, Council Member Harry Thomas and, and Councilperson uh, Charlotte Farmer also in, in the photo. They continue to grow, and I heard uh, last week that uh, they will they serve two states, 100,000 square miles in several counties, and they are moving into a third state, so we expect some really good uh, success for that company, uh, especially for San Angelo. Principal LED, this is one of our brightest moments that, um, that we've had to assist Principal LED in their expansion efforts. Uh, <clears throat> in, their, in that process, we were able to work with the owner of the building, the realtor broker and principal LED to secure the former Taylor Publishing building. No longer will this building be empty. Principal LED is closing two other operations in two different states to create new jobs in San Angelo. We expect over 100 at peak uh, of new jobs and the property's market value will increase as, as it becomes an operating facility. On an annual basis at full operation, this project will support 21 million in annual e economic output. 
So if you've noticed, uh, by the way, uh, Principal LED vacates a 10,000 square foot building that will also remain on the tax rolls that we can market and place another employer in that facility. So you notice there's a trend. Most of the companies are growing and they're moving to a larger facility. One of the benefits of certifying the industrial park was the master planning that came along with it. Uh, other benefits included the site studies that I've already talked about. Uh, in terms of additional uh, infrastructure improvements, we are currently building a sewer line working with the city right here to serve <coughs> these parcels. So it'll serve Warren Cat and, and some of these parcels. We just sold, uh, we closed on this property uh, about a week and a half ago. So that was one of our most recent sales. We're also working with uh, Tom Green County as they bring, and, and obviously uh, Coast DC just helps to facilitate. We rely on our water department, our uh, sewer department uh, uh, to, to provide the work in the engineering design and the, and the work with the, with the county. In fact, um, our city engineer and their department is helping us with this sewer main to uh, Warren Cat. But this line over here is a sewer main that will go to the new jail. And we have partnered with uh, Tom Green County to help pay for this portion of the cost that will help support that portion of, of uh, the industrial part uh, of phase two. Finally, uh, we're applying for an EDA grant to provide public infrastructure to this 52 acres here. For AEP. Uh, that will also include uh, improvements for this drainage that you see in green. So we're expecting um, that by the end of this year we'll have 13.4 million on the tax rolls as a result of the um, industrial park activity. I think that's a pretty good return for $122,000. Uh, that's a conservative number. Uh, it's a possibility that we may hit 18 million at the end of this year. If not, we're expecting another 14 million to 18 million in new property on the tax rolls at the end of 2018 if we're successful with the projects that we're working on. With that, I'll be glad to help answer any questions that you may have. So how many acres are, are still existing for sale or for development out of the 300 initial acres? Out of the 400 acres, so, so if you notice, we have taken up some acreage here for drainage and here. Um, I suspect, I'd say about 50, 60, 60 to 70 acres, just in my rough estimate. Now, are we the only certified industrial park in the state of Texas? The only certified super park. Meaning with, the 500 with, acres. Meaning greater than 500 acres. There are specific certifications. There are smaller acreage. And there's also uh, certifications for like a data, data center certified industrial park. So if we use best practices and look at other people who have these certified parks, who would they be or they don't exist is what you're saying. So we are the only certified park. The Do only certified that? super park, yes. Super now, park. I will tell you that um, when we um, were asked to participate in this uh, AEP quality site program with McCallum Sweeney, we were on a conference call with some other, I'd say, 24 other economic development corporations, only two of those economic development corporations took advantage of moving forward with the study uh, and seeking the certification. It was ourselves, and I believe the other one was in Gray County, Longview. Do you have room for expansion? We do. In fact, um, as, as, as I mentioned, we're pursuing an EDA grant to provide infrastructure to this 52 acres. But at the same time, we want to begin, and of course, we're going to we're going to complete this uh, drainage that we want to uh, make happen to, um, to make those improvements to the industrial park. But we also want to begin master planning for this phase here. And that's another 100 acres. Are you looking at other areas for industrial parks or 
certified super parks within um, the city of San Angelo? We are um, specifically the airport. Uh, we'd like to see the airport gain more um, business um, and industrial activity. We think that helps support uh, that enterprise. Uh, and obviously, um, uh, I, th I think that'll bolster the, the airport. Uh, we are uh, potentially looking at other uh, areas for, uh, just because we can, we can see uh, into the future that um, uh, the growth of an industrial park is, is moving very uh, rapidly. We do have a lot of inquiry. Uh, and so we are beginning to plan uh, looking at other areas in the city that would uh, uh, help um, facilitate another industrial park. There's always been the conversation that when this area was located and selected for the industrial park that we were a little short-sighted and not looking at properties that would either be quickly serviced by airports and rail or obviously highway, which this one is highway, but would certainly think that the greatest mm. opportunity that exists going forward would be, would be looking at transportation as an opportunity for San Angelo, and that means rail and that means airport. And certainly the I-14, I-27 brings some interest to this because of the, quote, additional interstate, if you will. But I think before we look at much further growth and development, unless it, there's something very specific to this, that we need to look at the other opportunities of connecting an industrial park by rail and by airline or airport cargo. Those are areas that certainly have great growth opportunity and we certainly need emphasis on in this market. Roland, uh, Brenda asked you approximately how many acres we still have out there to market. We've got a lot of properties that appear right here that uh, could be marketed to some companies. Uh, with the amount of success that you've had in the last 36 months, do you anticipate that most of these properties will uh, will find new new owners within the next 36 months? Yes, I do. In fact, we are negotiating with those two parcels now. So that that leaves vacant one, two, three, only five parcels uh, in that developable area. Uh, we do have potential for this backside uh, as well. Uh, in uh, I think what you need to know is mentioned in the background, there's about 333 acres back here on what we call phase three uh, that the city has uh, back in, um, I think it was back in 2003, um, allowed uh, Coast City C to use for um, master planning purposes. So it has been included in the master plan. Uh, if you notice, we, uh, we have a depiction of uh, a um, 100 acre uh, facility there. In fact, um, about a year and a half ago, we were working with a prospect that needed 100 con contiguous acres like the industrial park. Uh, one of the advantages to the industrial park um, is that we had all the infrastructure required. It is very rare that we're going to find anywhere around the city that all of the infrastructure is in place. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we received the certification. And so it is very rare that, that we'll find that. So when we do find an ideal uh, piece of property, we're going to have to invest in some additional uh, improvements to make sure that all of the requirements are there for infrastructure. And those infrastructure improvements are all in the P&L statement? Yes, ma'am. I just want to emphasize the need for industrial park development to be close to a railroad and close to an airport. I think this has had some great success. It's taken an awful long time to find the success that justifies the industrial park to a large degree. Those successes have been terrific lately and we're excited to have them. I don't want us to be short-sighted in thinking this is the opportunity, this is the location that moves us forward in terms of economic growth and development. I want us to broaden our perspective. I uh, would like to, <clears throat> to add that I believe the recent successes that we've had are due to Roland, his team, and his ability to work very well with the chamber. Uh, 
instead of competing against one another, they have worked together as a team, and this is the results. Just my opinion. Any other comments? You know, I would say, Mayor, <clears throat> having served, uh, I guess you'd say, two different tours on that on the uh, Development Corporation board, you never want your city government, or at least in my opinion, you never want your city government to, to really be risky. But if there is a risk-taking arm of any city, it is a development corporation. And you, I, I, to my knowledge, somebody's going to have to check this out. To my knowledge, the development corporation, since, is, since its existence, 1999, has only had one loss when we when we uh, made an investment in in a business, which is pretty remarkable for a development corporation. And fortunately, it was fairly small. Um, I would also say that sometimes, you know, you don't want your city government to necessarily make money. But this has the opportunity to generate, as we can see from the activity here, to generate revenue for the benefit of the city. So, you know, there, there, there are, uh, Roland has done a really good job since he has been here three years of bringing much of this to the forefront and to fruition. So I would applaud Roland and what he has done and continues to do in the prospects that, that he currently has that he's talking to. Thank you. Thank you. Roland, if I can do a follow-up here. How do you get this message out? I mean, we, we've got to get this message out. It's got to go to somebody. We would love to have anybody that's outside come inside city limits to, to put them on the base for sure. But the point is, are we getting that message out to those people that know the benefits of making the move and a property swap and coming in? <clears throat> Do you need more tools to do that? I mean, who do you send with the message, and do they have the tools to convey it, including yourself? How do you go find that person? Well, it's a, it's a sort of a mixed bag. Um, we've, we've tried different things. We've tried marketing um, on TV. We've done direct mail. We've done letters. Uh, what we find more effective is knocking on doors. We specifically call companies. Uh, we take all the different industry sectors, and, and we'll call and set up appointments, and at that point, we begin to create an awareness of the programs that we have, and we try to market the industrial part. In terms of, uh, we do have it posted on our website, and uh, the chamber helps us with their with their marketing and recruitment. And so, we receive um, inquiries uh, via email or uh, or phone calls, um, and they may come through the chamber, they may come through us, and and they may see the uh, the um, um, the map and may inquire about it. I, I think it's it still remains one of those, uh, as you say. I think as you noted, one of those unkept, uh, one of those jewels that that needs to that we need to tout more. Uh, there are some more effective tools uh, that we can go after. Anyone that is searching our website that is specifically looking at our industrial park, we we are going to be looking at that that kind of technology. Uh, so that we can be uh, much more proactive in reaching out to those that are, uh, by chance, uh, looking, monitoring, or uh, trying to visit uh, our, our properties. Thank you, Ro. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We are going to go on to item 6H, consider first public hearing of an ordinance to modify the code of ordinances to require the purchasing policy to be adopted by council through resolution. So, Julia, are you here? Yes. yes. Hi, Julia Antley. I'm the city's purchasing manager, and today we're going to discuss possible cleanup of the city's code of ordinance. So right now, the city's code of ordinance has the purchasing policy in full detail. What we're wanting to do is um, consistent with best practices and kind of bring it up to a higher level and have the council approve the purchasing policy by a written resolution. And uh, what that will do is, just to clarify, um, it'll change nothing regarding 
the city council's authorization or approval levels. Anything over $50,000 would still come to you for vote. Um, but what it does is um, just kind of clears up the code of ordinance. And the reason we want to do that is to um, remove again the policy level details. And um, what we'll do is um, have the presentation next, or I'm sorry, just on uh, consent, next council meeting for the purchasing policy so everyone can review that. Um, but the um, current changes to the code of ordinance are expensive. Um, anytime we make a change to the code of ordinance, it requires a um, recodification, which is expensive to maintain and also leaves room for errors if there's any sort of um, errors or omissions, if we repeat something, if something in the policy changes but the code of ordinance doesn't get recodified. So it leaves kind of some room for um, errors. So we'd just like to clarify um, that by removing it, we'll be leaving the city open to uh, less, less risk, I guess. Julia? So you're not changing the policy today? Uh, no, um, it actually you're requires a first reading and then a second reading of the ordinance to redact the policy from the code of ordinances. So at next council meeting is when we could actually approve it by resolution. Okay, so you'll bring a separate agenda item, a resolution, which contains the purchasing policy? Correct. Okay. I'm a little confused. So on the red on the supporting documents that are in red, are those the things that are being changed? Let me pull it up, but yes, I believe so. It's, we I show need, our I red think lines. we need to see that. Yeah, because we've got it here, so let's see it. If you can. Maybe not. Okay. Basically, in practice, all that's going to change is instead of taking two readings of council and it being a codified part of our ordinance, our purchasing policy to go through that process, it's still going to require a reading of council through a resolution adopting whatever rules we have. So like Julia says, that'll make it um, more efficient to make changes to that policy as well as reducing the size of our code of ordinances, which does reduce costs for us. So in simple terms, explain to me what we're talking about. I'm confused. Purchasing policy outlines um, anything under anything over $50,000, we have state codes that require us to handle those purchases in a certain manner. Anything less than $50,000, the city adopts rules telling us as directors, um, when do we need Daniel's signature? When do we need two written bids? When do we, can we just go out and make a purchase? So that's essentially what the purchasing policy does. It spells out all of those rules for any purchase less than $50,000. Um, one of the rules that we're going to talk about is what came up earlier this morning regarding how we do construction contracts. So um, typically councils, adopt policies telling us how we make purchases under $50,000. Right now, that is contained in the Code of Ordinances, which is pretty unusual. Typically, it is just a policy that's adopted through resolution by a city council. So the, the key today is we're moving this from the code to uh, a policy adopted by council, but we're actually not changing the policy today because it takes two readings. That would occur at the next meeting and there will be a detailed discussion about policy updates uh, for council at that discussion. This is just the first step to move it from the code of ordinances to a resolution-based approval. Do I have questions from the council? Do I have a motion? Move. A second. Second. Let me give you some additional assurance, some comfort, I think. If what you hear next time you're not comfortable with, you don't have to approve the second reading and you don't have to approve that resolution. So uh, you, you have the comfort of the status quo, if that gives you comfort, uh, until those other items are approved. 
Actually, the way that the policy is going to read is it doesn't become effective until the ordinance is effective. So there's no gap in time between what's currently codified and what's going to be in the policy. Mary, we can have that on the screen at the uh, at the next city council okay. meeting as Thank well. You. Uh -huh. I would just also add that um, all of our other financial policies, like the investment policy, um, the capital asset policy, things like that, are also adopted by resolution. I think Teresa would agree that it's very unusual for, for those policies to be in the ordin ordinance in the first place. So that's why we're redacting it and, and going to approve by resolution from now on. Okay. All right. I have a motion. I have a second. Do I have public comment? Just, just curious as to why it was at least like this to begin with, just this one. This is just part of the cleanup of ordinances we're doing, you know, based on on um, Councilman Thomas's recommendation, and that we were doing anyway, bringing our code up to current standards for a city our size, as well as finding ways to reduce regulations and to um, save costs. I think last year we were over our budget on recodifications, so every time there's an ordinance change, we do have to pay our code service for that. And this is we're looking at policies that it's not necessary to either duplicate it in the ordinances or to have it in there at all, that we can just do it through a resolution. You know, the main thing that our code of ordinances does, it creates a penal um, code, essentially. So you're not gonna find me $200 if I fail to abide by the purchasing policy. I mean, we might have other penalties we're gonna do, but it's not gonna be a criminal fine. And so there's no point in having this kind of policy in a criminal statute. Yes, Rashta. Hi, Raj the Khan uh, for the public comment section. Um, I just wanted some clarification. Um, if it's moved out of the um, code of ordinance, will it be just as easy to find for the public? The purchasing division could push it, put it on the website as like a handout sort of information sheet. They could, but I mean, so are all the policies sort of available somewhere? They're certainly available if you know if you do a public information request, but uh, most of those things are available on the website, and we we try to be as uh, open with that stuff and transparent as possible. Okay, thanks. Any other public comment? Then we will go to vote. All in favor of the um, item H. Um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. We now move to I discuss and consider appointing council member representation, three members to the Concho River Water Master Advisory Committee, and Brian, I believe you're on. Yes. So the previous um, uh, appointees to this uh, committee were Dwayne Morrison, Marty Self and Bill Richardson. There is a meeting that occurs once per year. That's the reason we haven't filled the, the one that's been open a little bit longer. Um, but there is a upcoming meeting in July, so it'll be before we have the new council seated. So we really need to go ahead and, and do this one a little bit out of order and go ahead and appoint three members uh, for the meeting in July. Ryan, on this one, this is typically the mayor and two council members, is that correct? That's historically what historically it's been like. Brian, do you know the dates of that meeting? It's in July, but I think Bill can help me out. Uh, July 13th, uh, 10.30 a.m. Do I have any um, nominations for... Um, the three people, typically mayor plus two additional city council members. Um, do I have some um, recommendations by I'll, council? I'll nominate with the mayor, Tom and Tommy. Tom and Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This is the right side of the council board. So <laughs> whatever Charlotte says. The left side. That's Tommy, Tom, and Thomas. Tom. <laughs> oh, isn't that, yeah. Three, Actually, like I said, it looks like uh, um, okay. You said, you said pallbearers. Pallbearers. The only thing distinctive is the time. And, and I'll let my wife know that. Okay. But anyway, I have no problem with that, and I can be available for that date. I was worried about dates later in the month, but that's fine. I'm good with that. 
So Brenda Gunter Mayer, uh, Tommy Hebert, and Tom Thompson would be the candidates that I. Yeah, we can we get that second? second? And of course, the second we just got from Lane. So thank you very much. So now. Any conversation, further conversation on appointing Brenda Gunter Mayer, Tom and Tommy as the three appointees? The rest of y'all just wait, it's your turn next. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take a vote on that. Um, I suspect since I'm one of the nominees, I don't know that I'm supposed to vote All for in myself. All in favor <laughs> of accepting the nomination for the Water Advisory Board of Brenda Gunter. Tom Thompson and Tommy Hebert, please indicate by saying aye. 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 In any nays, motion carries. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. You're welcome. <clears throat> Discussion and consider appointing council member representation to members to the Metropolitan Planning Organization Board. Presentation by MPO Director Major Hoffines and City Clerk Brian Kendrick. Welcome. Good afternoon. The uh, MPO, the uh, San Angelo Metropolitan Planning Organization, in light of the recent elections, has found their policy board one member short with the vacancy of the mayor. The uh, representation of the city on the Metropolitan Planning Operation Board is either two elected officials or one elected official and one designee. That designee is currently occupied by City Manager Daniel Valenzuela. Typically and historically in the past, it has always been that the mayor and the city manager were the city representatives on the MPO board. So we come to you today looking for another representative. Representatives to the MPO board have to be nominated and approved by their board, their council, whatever it may be. So that leaves it up to you all to select someone for our board. At this time also, it's up to you. You can reaffirm Daniel as the, the designee, or you can pick someone else. Uh, yeah. Daniel has been a great representative for the MPO. He knows what the MPO is about. He believes in it. So I encourage you to please leave him there. We don't need another vacancy, but that's entirely up to you. I would like to recommend that Brenda, our mayor, and Daniel, our current representative, continue to serve on the MPO board. Second. Any comment? All in favor of, oh, Charlotte, would all, you please take that over again? All in favor of Brenda and, uh, Brenda Gunter and, what is his name? City yeah, manager Daniel, Daniel Valenzuela. <laughs> uh, being our representative, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I guess maybe public comment? There being none, Ms. Bayer? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd also like to make a, a short little announcement. On August the 10th at our August uh, policy board meeting, we are gonna have a representative from Federal Highway Administration and also from TxDOT uh, and one from Texas Transportation Institute that are going to be there for a workshop. It's not going to be a normal public policy board meeting. It's going to be a workshop, basically an MPO 101 type uh, meeting. We are encouraging all of the city council to come and join us. I'll be sending out a uh, message on that within the next couple of days. We encourage you to forward your questions so that we can have this program tailored to San Angelo. But you are all encouraged and welcome to come. Uh, if it goes late, we plan on providing lunch. When is the workshop again? It's going to be on August the 10th. It'll start at 8.30 in the morning. The, the board may decide to move that later, but I will include that time in the meeting. We have a board meeting next week. And we, we, it will be posted will. for a possible quorum as well. Yes, so. yes. yes sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. On to item K, discussion, consideration of appointing council member representation on the I-14 Gulf Coast Strategic Highway Coalition. Brian and Roland. Yes, uh, currently is vacant due to Mayor Morrison uh, 
you know, leaving us. So uh, we do have that vacancy. It just needs to be um, passed by the board, would, and it can be any any of you, as I understand it. Roland could could answer any specific questions you have, but it it's really up to y'all. Okay. I'd like to volunteer for that. Let me, let me throw throw a kink in your in your volunteer service, oh, Harry. <clears throat> Sometimes the senior most elected official, not in terms of service, but in terms of I guess stature, um, t titular head. Sometimes maybe the mayor might be needed to give a little extra oomph to something. So, if, Harry, if that does not insult you. It doesn't bother me one bit. Too much. <clears throat> Maybe it would be. Last year, or doing just volunteered for it. And as Brian said, need a, need a volunteer. Brenda's been just appointed to two of these. Uh, other I was, was going to ask, my next was going to be, Mayor, yes, do, sir. Do, you, do you have the time? I always have time. Okay. Well, okay. I would like to add, sure. since I'm, sure. we're talking about the, the I-14, and uh, I'd mentioned it to Roland out in the audience, it is very important or crucial, in my opinion, that our person that is on this new board uh, be in conjunction with our efforts in Ports to Plains and our efforts with I-27. So that's a dual serving and dual purpose. And uh, always have had the pleasure of uh, John Barrio on uh, uh, Coast of DC as, as a backup there that the both, when you have the meetings scheduled for I-27 and I-14 in the same location, but at the same time in different parts of the building, you've got that double share, but you cut down on expenses by having to send three you know, or four people. So I just want to throw that in there as consideration to the mayor if, if you know that interest is there. It is. Mayor, I just wanted to add one one more yes, thing. Yes, sir. Sorry, Roland. Um, that's okay. the the um, The coalition meets only once a year in January, so that's when they have the annual meeting. However, um, as you saw from the report that I sent uh, over the weekend to you, a, a comprehensive report of the entire year, we had an unveiling in the month of April, the unveiling of the signage um, of um, some 22, 25 miles from uh, Coppers Cove to Belton, and so we attended, representatives from this area attended, so that may be some additional activities, but normally it's just one meeting a month. We do expect- uh, a, year. A, year. a year. A year. A year, I'm sorry. Yeah. One meeting a year, but we do expect, uh, because it has so much momentum, um, is getting the designation from Brady to, to through San Angelo to Midland to happen this year, and so there may be some congressional visits uh, they may happen uh, this year, but I'll just throw that out so that you know what kind of activity may be happening. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Not yet. Not you. I would. I would. Go ahead. Yeah, I, have a motion. I would move that uh, we appoint Mayor Gunter as I representative to the I-14. Mayor Gunter's been uh, nominated to be the Gulf Coast representative. Uh, any other comments or volunteers? To assist her with all of that, uh, Mayor Gunter, all ayes. Please say aye. Aye. Any Motion. nays? Motion carries. And no public comment? Thank you. Back to you. All right. So we are now going to go into executive session. So uh, we will do so. Um, the expectation is it could be about an hour and a half. It'd be about an hour and a half, yes. Uh, for executive sessions, for any of those who want to come back for any of the follow-up and administrative issues, anticipate at least an hour and a half. All right. Need to read. Yeah. Oh, I must yeah, read yeah, it. Yeah, One of my reading. Executive session under the provision of government code, Title V, Open Government, Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government, Chapter 551, Open Meetings, Subchapter D, Exemptions to require that meetings be open under the following sections. Is that all I need to read? Okay, I'm going to read uh, Section um, A, Section 551.071. 
One, A, consult with attorney when the government body seeks the advice of its attorney about pending or contemplated litigation regarding, one, 2013 seal coating program contract, two, Templeton Construction, Inc., three, All Say, Inc., versus the City of San Angelo, Texas Corolla Engineers, Incorporated, four, City of San Angelo versus Spielman Technologies, Incorporated, section B, Section 551.072, deliberations about real property regarding 1, 703 South Chadburn, 2, property located on River Frontage, 3, the Ford Ranch. Section C or C, Section 551.071, 2, consult with attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with this chapter regarding condemnation. Number eight, that's it. Sorry, I don't have to keep reading. I'm stopped, <laughs> officially stopped. And we are at- 11.38. Thank you very much. Executive session. And um, I want to make an announcement that we will be uh, looking at some dates, which we can do now, should we want to, to uh, put together a workshop to discuss the um, railroad museum contract. Potential dates. Does anybody have? I'll tell you what my schedule is next week. Always fails what I heard. I'm always available, <laughs> particularly on Thursday the 15th at um, 3.30. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> oh, what? No. <laughs> the O is good. Oh, good. Can we do this? Can we do some day in the morning? I just like better mornings than the afternoon. I have nothing in the morning next week. I have a... You would be a morning person. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I'm not. By the afternoon, I'm tired. I would love to start these things at 8 in the morning. But I heard somebody... We're not discussing that right now. What we're discussing is the railroad <laughs> museum. Tom, we're not One issue at first. Eight in the I'm good for it every day in the and morning. And if you had a restaurant that you know, 8 a.m. <laughs> does not work. Yeah. <laughs> we're saying but I'm wondering if... if June the 15th at 3.30 works. Works for me. I'm good. We're good. I'm good. The workshop will be um, providing, um, certainly people from the Railroad Museum are available, uh, Thursday the 15th at 3.30. Okay. And who will be contacting the museum to make sure that this is on their schedule? I'll work with Cindy to make sure. Okay. Great. How many can go? Everybody? Yeah, we'll actually post. We're going to post for that. Post that as a workshop so everyone agenda. would be available. That is Thursday the 15th at 3.30. Okay. Then we well, move back to, out the reminder, do I need to put it in? Um, consider approving the following board nomination, Cosa DC, Edward Carrasco, SMD1, to a first full term ending February 2019. Move approval. Second. I would like to make sure that as we move forward on putting people on these boards that we, um, that the city staff um, make sure that board members understand their responsibilities and understand in-depth knowledge of what they're going to be dealing with so that there's no confusion and people are voting just because they're up there, not because they're well informed. So I want to make sure that when we make these nominations and approve them, that there's some board training that goes with it before someone makes um, too much investment in voting. I would also ask uh, that since we're in the process of uh, having new people up here that we get an updated uh, of those people that are on each of those boards and commissions and what their terms are. Yes, sir. Either this Friday uh, in the Thank packet you. or next Friday, you'll be getting a complete manual overview of each board with the bylaws and so forth. Thank you. These boards we rely on for a lot of uh, voting and representation, and I'm not sure that we have educated board members to the full extent that they need to before they vote on items. So that's got to become a huge priority. Okay. 
password that me and Tommy just got put on. When is that one scheduled? I believe he said July, July 13th, 13th at 1030. What is that? Yes, that was better. correct. We, we've talked about maybe making that an evening meeting, so maybe we could open that up for some of the community to come see that. Would that be an option to discuss? That is not called, the meeting's not called by the city. Uh, it's called by the, the by the organization. Okay. So. July 13th. July 13th. July. July 13th. The water board meeting. Another Workshop is June 15th. June 15th. The Railroad 15th. Museum is Railroad June Museum the 15th. Yeah. Workshop. We've now moved on to another conversation in regards to. Yeah, we shouldn't be talking we, about let's, uh, One thing at a time. Yeah. Let's stop the chatter. If we could, please, for just finishing one conversation at a time. Let's finish up. The Railroad Museum is June the 15th at 3.30. We took. Do I need to do any, we don't have to vote or anything on that. So that is end of that conversation. We now the, we move in to. We had the motion and then, the second on the Edward Carrasco. But correct, we, we now need to vote. All in favor of Edward Carrasco being put to full term on Costa DC say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 7-0. Consider a possible special called water workshop on June the 13th, 2017. Is that the one you're asking Tommy to move to the um, evening? That, that no, is not. You are asking about the MPO one. That is no? not the same one as the yeah. Concho River Water Master Advisory Committee. Two separate meetings. Okay. They're on the 13th of, this one's on the 13th of June. The next one will be on the 13th of July. So the one that's for next week. The one that we're proposing for next week. Right, proposing for next week. Can that one be an evening meeting? Well, it would be uh, when y'all want it, but we were proposing to be a morning meeting. But uh, Well, if, if we wanted the public to be a little bit more involved and it's something as sensitive to them as the water part of it, it has been suggested to me that possibly if that was the – and I don't know how many people are going to come to that one here off council. I think there's uh, only a few of us that are actually required to be there, so – and I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here. No, but I think we should Maybe have a, as, um, some of these meetings in the evening for public participation, and I think that that makes sense. I'll be voting for you, Governor. If you're referring to the Water Advisory, the Water Master Advisory Committee meeting, that's July 13th at 1030. That meeting is set by the TCEQ. Right. That's so not that's, the one I'm referring to. That's okay. What's next week? That was a workshop that we wanted to, to have with the council. Uh, there's a you know water supply and water issues are a, a high priority have been and continue to be uh, there's a lot of moving parts uh, not the least of which are the city's water rights or which are some of the most uh, complicated in the in the country and so we wanted to have a time to uh, in a workshop type environment to just go from start to finish with all of the water supply issues the things that we are doing and, and uh, the planning and, and just have some good conversation on those issues so that you had uh, understanding of where we've been, where we are, and, and uh, help us as we develop a plan for the moving forward. What I works, like the idea of the evening. Uh, I like the idea of an evening. It was presented to me. Sometimes those things get too big, and we take an hour-long meeting and spread it over four hours. But long story short, if it's complement to uh, doing an evening meeting next week, that'd be preferred. It's also on Tuesday the 13th. There's a chamber luncheon at 1130. So many of us would be pressed for time. Um, if we started at 10:30, so my recommendation is to start at 6 p.m. Okay, we we were anticipating that. I mean, this could be, we could fill a day. So I mean, we we, I would think that we would need some, you know, two to three hours for this uh, as a minimum to to cover all of the issues. Start five. We start at five. That would be my concern. Is if you got an evening meeting that's a four or five hour meeting, and you start at six o'clock. Then you you get into later times when when people are not gonna gonna be there anyway. So we need we need to figure out how long we're gonna have the meeting, and then we can figure out if starting at 5:30 or 6 o'clock is appropriate. Well, I guess the meeting will be as long as we have questions that need to be answered, a discussion that gets extensive. So that's hard to control. But what we can do is set the meeting at 5 o'clock. And if we need to set and continue it at a follow-up meeting to finish the subject, we can certainly do that. I would prefer that. That helps me with also with my employers. 
Well, there's discussion going on out there. I would like to ask where the railroad workshop museum, the <laughs> railroad museum workshop meeting is going to be. We said that we were going to hold it in 618. Either there or we'll have it in the east mezzanine of City Hall, one of the two. But if y'all would like it know. closer to the railroad where you could actually walk across. Yes, because yes. if we need to walk over there and take a look at anything, we're in close proximity. As long as it's not booked for something, which is probably not. Okay. And, and as far as location for the workshop, we were proposing the east mezzanine so that we would be in a more workshop type environment. So what if we need a field trip? We'll load up in a bus. <laughs> Just checking. Okay. Five o'clock on June the 13th, Thank we you. will be doing a water workshop. Water workshop. Okay. Everybody on board? Yeah. And East Mezzanine, mm -hmm. as just discussed. Are you sending an invite out? Is that going to be scheduled for us, or do we need to add it manually? Oh, we can, I, can, I can have Becky put that okay. in for everybody. Oh, no problem. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> They want to duplicate it. Okay. <laughs> I do that all the time. All right. Are there any announcements and consideration for future agenda items? I have a comment. I go ahead, Charlotte. Uh, I want to thank the staff. Uh, particularly, I asked for Friday packet memos in uh, Friday before last. The uh, memo on the Sherwood Way construction I found to be very informative. I appreciate the time that was spent and put into it. And then the other one that I requested with reference to water. Where'd he go? Bill Rice Department. Anyway, I want to thank him for that. And also the fire marshal uh, report on structures around town. I appreciate the time and the effort. That's extra from their daily duties that they have to compile and put these informations together and to keep council members informed and I appreciate it. I'll relay the appreciation. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that we um, were talking about doing and we can discuss dates right now is to develop a council workshop um, in terms of establishing priorities prior to the budget workshops that will start taking place in August. So the question mark is we could do that the last week of June and or we could, if you felt like it, wait until after July the 8th um, or the 18th to do that, which would get it closer to budget conversation and would then include the last city council members. So do I have input or thought process on that? Those are budget workshops. This is a council workshop to establish our own priorities, our own as and to sort of establish those as um, priorities prior to looking at the budget numbers to make sure that our priorities fit into a budget. So the question is, do you want to wait until after the last council member is brought on board? Yes. Okay. So what we would, Charlotte, does that mean you don't want to, <laughs> you don't, Charlotte's okay, done. yeah. I don't have a vote. <laughs> that kind Wait. Of limits, that kind of limits the, the time frame then because that person won't be brought on board until uh, 18th. 18th. And then our first budget workshop is scheduled when? 22nd. 22nd. August, August 8th. So that gives us three weeks. That's okay. So what we could go ahead and do, if you want to, is schedule the workshop immediately after that. And so what we could do is schedule that workshop, for example, on Thursday the 20th of July, starting at 2. I think we could use that as a meeting. What time? Thursday the 2. Any other input? Yes, I'm going to Las Vegas on the 17th. <laughs> All right. <Very> good. <laughs> East mezzanine as well on that. Yes, sir. So we will on Thursday, July 20th at 2 o'clock in the East mezzanine June. start our conversations as a council on priorities and strategic plans going forward. Okay. I believe if there's no further announcement. 
Oh, there is? Tommy and I have been talking about doing a joint uh, town hall. We haven't set a day or time, so for everybody, District 1, District 5, uh, be on the lookout. Uh, we'll get with Anthony and, and try to reserve a spot and time for everybody to attend. Con content as well. Try to put some, some content out there. So is there anything specific you want that for? No, the not at, the, at this, at this okay. juncture. Now, you know, Lane and I were talking, and this would I, I would uh, I say address this to all the council. The only the only district that District One does not touch is District Two. Um, it touches every other single member district here just because of the geographic configuration. So you know, at some point over the next let's just say eight to nine months, I'm thinking it might be helpful for, it would be helpful for me if, you know, each council member, if they were willing to, to have a town hall with me, because there may be some common specific issues to both districts. So that was just a thought. So Lane and I had already talked about that. So that's the reason he brought it up. Future agenda item I'd like to have done. I'd like to get an update on street projects. Uh, I know we just talked about uh, the uh, steel coat, but I'd like to see on the major re redone where we are for, for the rest of this year and any proposed start dates for those other streets for uh, next year. Uh, if we can get that done in the next six to eight weeks, uh, it would be helpful. Daniel Benedetti supposed to be here picked up Friday? Yes, sir. Well, that's what we're shooting for. So, tagging on to what Harry just said, uh, I would just like to add. This doesn't need to be, uh, at least in my mind, doesn't need to be um, uh, a council presentation unless the council wants it. But I have a specific uh, location on Foster Road that I would just like, a, really, a staff update to get all the background and all the history um, on the um, the the flooding that they have there on Foster Road. If that's Shane and Russell, whomever that would be, um, if y'all would just let me know within the next short uh, time frame. Well, uh, Tommy, we'll, we'll get together and meet anyway. There's okay. something that we may be doing there anyway. Okay, so all right, I need good. On that. Okay. okay, good. Any other announcements or comments or suggestions? Move to adjourn. I have a move to adjourn. So move. I guess everyone is out of here. This meeting is over. We're done. Dinner is available.